A little louder than that. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether they're perceived or unperceived by those present, and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Okay. Roll call, Madam Secretary. Mr. Andre? Here. Mr. Costa? Here. Mr. Hart? Here. Mr. Martins? Here. Mr. Maynard? Here. Mrs. Panchley? Here. Yes, Here. Uh, salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're going to do this next, Matt. Do that next. <clears throat> so, Madam Superintendent, any recognition awards this meeting? Yes, Mayor. I'm very pleased uh, to announce that this evening we are recognizing uh, 141 high school students who achieved and are recipients of the 2015 John and Abigail Adams Scholarship Award. So, um, great job. And I know we not all of our 141 students are able to um, join us tonight, but we are going to go down um, to the floor and award uh, and call out all of the names of the scholarship um, recipients uh, so that they can be uh, recognized. And again, congratulations, students. Excellent job. Certainly, it's a uh, pleasure to have so many students achieve the Abigail uh, uh, Scholarship. Um, that allows them to have uh, free tuition. They still have to pay for the books, but nevertheless, it's a, a great savings to them. And I'd like to invite uh, Mrs. Ponce, the, the principal over at Durfee, to come down and they'll be calling out the names along with the superintendent and the students can uh, come forward. So, so this really was about last year, so I'd like the senior team, if I may, come up, because really they're the ones who prepare these kids and should be giving out, um, calling out their names and giving them the awards. So if I can have Mrs. Fogarty, Vice Principal Brown, Ms. Napolitano. All right, you guys, you can call the names right from here. Call them right at the beginning. I thought I wouldn't let them off. Okay, before we um, begin calling out the names, I'll uh, just go over what the criteria uh, is for students to receive the John and Abigail Adams Scholarship. Um, we, are re we have 142 that we are recognizing from the senior class. Um, those students must score either advanced or proficient in ELA math or their science MCAS, and they must have a combined score that would place them in the top 25% of that graduating class. So we are honored to say that we did have 142 that met that criteria. Um, Mrs. Ponce made recognition that, you know, the senior class has worked with them, um, you know, in preparing them for, for this test, and, and actually it's the teachers that have been working with them and their parents since, parents since they were probably born, obviously, and um, teachers since pre-K all the way up through grade 12. So it really is a team effort to have these students prepared 
um, to take that 10th grade MCAS, so the recognition certainly um, is to be shared amongst many. Uh, so I will turn this over this evening to um, Mr. Uh, Brown, um, and who's the current vice principal for this graduating class, and um, um, Mrs. Uh, Napolitano will begin reading the names for these students. Okay, we're going to start by reading the students' names. Come down this way. Mm -hmm. okay. Chelsea Aguiar. Naisha Alamo. Alexis Almeida. Brian Arujo. You can come right up. Bella Archambault. Brandon Arias. Mia Ruda. Brittany Baker, Benjamin Barrows, Christine Bartakowicz, Samantha Benavides, Noah Binsad, Laurel Bowie, Amber Bonaca, Brendan Botello, Amanda Bordeaux, Austin Brown, Haley Camara, Richard Candino, Justice Karen, Sarah Cavallo, Haley Casavent, <laughs> what did I just leave off? Aaron? Aaron Shabbat, Bryce Chichester, John Cipollini, Caitlin Coelho, Madison Coogan, Farisha Cooley, Nicholas Costa, Sierra Costa, Austin Cody, Sarah Curtis, Andrea DeFont, Karina DeCosta, Kendra De Silva, Kristen De Silva, Amanda Daughtry, Alicia D'Almeida, Michael Dempsey, Sarah Dimmick, Aaron Donovan, Celista Duart, Rachel Duvall, Ricardo Echevarria Jr., Katrina El Zorado, Nicole Emsley, Chester Fernandez, Katrina Ferreira, Nicole Ferreira, Meredith Forcier, Cheyenne Forcey, Michaela Franco, Alexis Frazier, Kayla Freitas, Katya Frias, Emily Furtado, Daisha Gagne, Ciara, Ciara Garafa, Amber Gasper, Laura Godet, Evan Giotis, Rochelle Gonzalez, Elizabeth Gonzalez, Leah Granham, Jadalyn Grimshaw, Seth Gilmet, Vieira, Alyssa, Alyssa Jasumi. Julia Karam, Thomas Katz, Thomas Kerrigan, Waldo Lise Loriano, Tyra, Tyra Lee, Kyle LePage, Tatiana Lopes, Casey Lown, Jacqueline Lucia. Jordan Machado. Abhishek Mas Masayeth, Kyle Manchester, Azalyn Martinez, Jose Martinez Maldonado, Christina Martins, Kaylin Massa, Alyssa Mateus, Brianna Mayette, Sierra McElroy, Ricky Meach, Nathan Medeiros, Jesus Mendez, Mateo Mendoza, Haley Michael, 
Shana Miranda, Edwin Montesinos, Davi Morimoto, Alexis Mata, Ibrahim Nayata, Allison Nato, Angelisa Navare, Nicole Oliveira, Joylea Ortiz, Ashlyn Pacheco, Brittany Pacheco, Hannah Pacheco, Allison Pace, Taylor Paiva, Lelianette Pastrana, Jasmine Pereira, Elena Pavid, China Phillips, Junior Petras, Annalise Pires, em Ember Pru, Hannah Raposo, Patrick Raposo, Angela Reed, Connor Riley, Nathaniel Roberts, Raven San George, Jillian Sardina, Michael Sarmento, Nicholas Sherwin, Sydney Silva, Teresa Silva, Brooke Silva, Sylvia, Cody Smith, Megan Soares, Simba Sunhas, Zachary St. Laurent, Jenna Tavares, Leanne Teodoro, Brooke Tevs, Hannah Torres, Kai Yohara, Samantha, Samantha Vertentes, Tiffany Vicente, Alyssa Viveros, Sabrina Viveros, Caitlin Xavier, Bryce Zarlanga, Madison Zenny, Tabitha Zimmer, and Justin Zululeta. So we have a box full of uh, beautiful cert certificates that if I had been able to um, keep up with Mr. Brown, could have handed them out. But we will um, give your certificates and all those who weren't able to be in attendance this evening um, to Principal Ponce to be handed out um, at school tomorrow. If you're here tonight and would like your uh, certificate tonight, we'll give her the box and um, perhaps out in the hall she can give uh, the certificates to those who are here. Thank you again and a big round of applause for our students. While the students uh, 
uh, excited students are getting their uh, uh, awards for the, uh, the scholarship um, will c continue on. Um, during the past summer, there was an awful lot of new technology brought into our classrooms. That technology comes in a box, and the box has to be opened. It has to be assembled, as far as all the wires are concerned, connections made, I, and it takes a lot of effort to get into the technology into all of our schools, all of our classrooms. Then comes the training on the, uh, on this equipment, uh, and the small group of people I worked very hard in getting it all ready for September uh, and continue to do so uh, as uh, uh, faculty uh, get trained on the equipment so they in turn can teach uh, the students and we have classrooms that are very up to date in technology. Without it, we're going backwards, but with it, we go forward. At this point in time, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Brian Michalizak uh, to come forward uh, and uh, give out the awards uh, for the people that made it all happen. Thank you. I've actually been a part of four different school building projects where we've invested, you know, millions of dollars in technology. However, in those cases, we had five, six, seven months to plan this out and really take our time doing so. Um, however, this past May, we had the luxury of the Forever School Committee investing in over $900,000 in new technology and replacement technology for many of our schools. So we had a short window to do this and, you know, the computers, Chromebooks, laptops, projectors, and document cameras were ordered in June. And then we had this overwhelming task of getting out all the old equipment that was still in the buildings and all the new equipment into the uh, building, into the, the buildings in a 60 day period because school had to open up, you know, without anyone missing a beat. Um, and I really want to thank first and foremost, Scott Cabral, who oversees the three technicians that um, we have working in our, our 17 buildings. He's done an outstanding job of not only taking over the uh, networking part of things and helping out on that end, but also, you know, setting the schedule for the summer. And he actually had the game plan to get everything done and by, you know, our benchmarks, you know, July uh, 31st, we were ahead of schedule, and by the start of school, when pe teachers started coming back in, we had over 1,000 uh, Chromebooks in place, set up, ready to go, and over 2,000 pieces of equipment taken out of the buildings and swapped out with new teacher laptops and other equipment. Um, Scott worked with his staff, with the building principals, and um, several different vendors, and they worked uh, with a few interns, who's one here tonight, or was he? Yeah, you know, he left on my note. Um, and they uh, came in early. They stayed late. They worked on weekends when needed, and because their ultimate goal was to get everything in before the start of school. And um, surprising, I actually thought we would do a. We we actually, I thought we thought we'd run into the uh, September more than we did, but we actually had everything in place for the uh, return of uh, staff. Um, and I actually just want to. Uh, commend them on a, such a wonderful job they did because um, once they had it in place, then we were able to turn it over to Frank Farris and his team of Brad Silver, Nicole Medeiros, and Christine Carnell. And they now began the process of working with the staff on actually using that equipment for instructional purposes, which is the goal of this whole uh, initiative. So I'd like to thank and have Scott Cabral, Stephen Angtel, and Aaron Dunst come up. And Patrick Dukowski is watching this on tape because his car broke down on the way here. So he'll somehow get this award. So I'd like to thank him. I'm gonna buy them ties for Christmas, by the way.
contract, they won't use it. All right, Eddie Costar. All right, next on the uh, agenda is citizens' input. Uh, Edward Costar, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, um, Madam Superintendent, members of the school committee, it's the last time for a while that I'll be able to address you as citizen and not colleague. And I certainly look forward to the day that I'll be able to call you a colleague. And I have a great deal of respect for the people that uh, are my friends that will not be on the school board next time I meet. But today, I'm here to speak about recent developments that suggest the changes in the air. The No Child Left Behind Act is now the Every Child Succeeds Act, giving more authority over education and assessment to communities and less to the federal government. And now we have Massachusetts House Bill 340, and you will hear about that tonight from Mr. Andrade, as this bill proposes a mandated three-year moratorium on all standardized testing, standardized testing in Massachusetts, including the MCAS and PARC. Now, I believe in high standards, but I also believe that high-stakes testing is a pendulum which has swung much too far in one direction over to the right. We become obsessed with standardized tests and the data which results. I think it's been fairly clear over the past several weeks or several months that data from testing can be confusing. It can be presented in a variety of ways. It can be presented as a glass that's half full or a glass that's half empty, while the water in the glass remains the same. High stakes standardized testing has become a great source of stress for teachers, parents, and certainly for students. It encourages teaching to a test rather than to a child. It sometimes promotes cookie cutter methodologies that dampen teacher and student creativity. It makes individualizing instruction difficult at best. It often overlooks developmental readiness, emotional problems, and the dreams of students. I trust those in our classrooms to decide how to best teach and how to best assess our standards. I trust them to be the experts. I want them to feel free to be creative. I want them to be able to be unafraid to deviate from a lesson plan when a teachable moment presents itself. I want students to be inspired to find their own dreams. And as you listen tonight to Mr. Andrade, please consider whether or not you support House Bill 340. I know I do. Change is in the air, and I respectfully suggest that we must embrace it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Costar. Next on the agenda, are, is the subcommittee reports and um, Madam Superintendent. No sub, uh, subcommittee reports this evening, Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> Next would be the um, superintendent's report. Uh, this agenda item is typically reserved for um, commendation and I think the celebration of our 142 uh, students tonight is, um, says it all, so thank you. If we keep up at this pace, we'll set our all-time record. <laughs> uh, next would be the approval of the minutes. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And uh, now uh, number eight, Committee of the Whole, beginning with travel requests. Motion to move all travel. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next, uh, donations. Motion to accept. Seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Next, contracts. Motion to accept all contracts. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And uh, 
Now, on to the discussion portion. And uh, number one, the uh, debate between MCAS and Park is presented by Dr. Roy. As you are aware, uh, this year we, you voted to take MCAS. Um, by December 18th, we once again need to choose between MCAS and POC. Uh, so given the recent developments with the, the Board of Education going to some sort of hybrid version, it's our recommendation that we, we stick with MCAS, which is the test that we took this year. Um, some things that you may want to, that you may need to understand. Um, is that if you do take POC as it was this year, you're held harmless for accountability levels. So that means, for example, if you took POC this year, you could not drop a level in schools, but that's not true for MCAS. Um, consequently, the same thing for next year. Uh, the other thing you should understand about uh, the, the movement to this hybrid MCAS or this next generation MCAS is that for this year only, there will be a few POC-like items included in the MCAS. Uh, for example, they will no longer be a long composition for ELA in grades four and seven, and they'll, as a substitute, will be a few um, POC-like items. So this year's MCAS will be pretty much the same with a few POC-like items. Uh, the state has plans for 2017 to create what they're calling the next generation MCAS. Questions? I know, Mr. Martin says that. Oh. Um, Mr. Martin. I reviewed this uh, uh, material. Um, could you tell me what hold harmless mm -hmm. is making reference to? Yes. So as you know, as in the memo that I sent to you on our accountability data, one of the statistics is used is the level of schools, level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, right? So if you chose to take POC this year, even if your data went down, that would say move you from a level two to a level three, the state did not do that. You were held harmless. You still remain, you would, your level as a school would never go down. It could possibly go up though. That was not the true for the districts that chose to take MCAS this year. So the, if you took POC last, last year or this upcoming year, your school accountability level will never go down, but it could possibly go up. That's not true for us this year because we chose to take MCAS and that and it'll be the same for this coming year. But it, will it be reported? It will be reported as the same, what would be reported, what the, in particular? Uh, the, the accountability level. Yes, but it, it would never go down. So even if the data sort of signifies that the, it should go down in levels, for example, if you go under the 20 percentile, you yes. should become a level three, the state would hold you in level two status if that was what you were in, in the existing year, in the previous year? Yeah, I guess uh, if the um, percentile is, say, 10, mm -hmm. I, does it, and then next year, okay, it goes to either stays a 10 or it goes down to an 8, is that report, a rec reported or does it? The percentile. The eight and yes. say ten. No, the percentile will still be recorded. It's the accountability levels, the level one, two, three, four, five, that would not change. The individual pieces of data would be reported, but the overall uh, accountability the level, level assigned would not right would not go down. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, Dr. Roy. Um, you, you did mention something about um, uh, park like. Mm. Items that are going to be incorporated into the MCAS this year, a few. Can, can mm -hmm. you get like more specific about that? What yeah, the state has not given us a lot of information. I do know, like I said, in particular this year, um, as as the case with MCAS in grades four and seven, you have a long composition piece. They are eliminating that for this year, and instead, the sort of writing piece is going to look like a POC item where kids are responding to a question about text. Um, so that's one transition. That's the only specific information I have 
It, right now they're telling us it's a few items and that's you know the only uh, substitution that they gave us some guidance on. We're, we're going to wait to hear more from the department on this. Okay, so more is going to be coming down the road for that? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any further? One, more, one yes. more question. Again, Mr. Martins. Um, right at the present time, we have used MCAST for quite a while, right? For at least 2010 or so. Earlier than that, I believe, yeah. I'm sorry? I believe it was <coughs> earlier than that. Uh, 2008? At a so, minimum, yeah. Okay. Well, um, so we have a we have a record of, of uh, uh, what is actually taking place. Um, if we were to switch to park, now we have a different scorecard uh, in there. So um, are you making any recommendation? Yes, our recommendation is to stick with MCAS. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I move that we uh, remain with MCAS uh, for the 16-17 um, uh, school year. Second. Any discussion on Mr. Martin's motion? Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Wright, I understand that this state is looking to have a hybrid MCAS, which, depending on which articles you read, Essentially, it's a park test disguised as a hybrid MCAS. I'm concerned because it looks like they're eliciting directions from school districts as to which test you want to administer. Is it park or is it MCAS? However, they're looking to put park-like questions in the MCAS. So is this, is this truly the department's will to get us to decide which one we want, or is this sort of, it, it seems to me as though they're asking us, do you want to do MCAS or do you want to do PARC? I'd be okay if MCAS was going to be left alone, but the fact that they're already signaling that if you want to choose MCAS, mm -hmm. it's fine, we just want to let you know there are going to be a small number of PARC-like questions. Well, what does that mean? And, and so one of my colleagues asked you, what does that mean? And, and your response was probably the best you could give, given the limited information that you have. I just wish if the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education were asking committees to take action on this, that they would provide us with additional information as to how many or what is a small amount of POC-like questions. Because if this is their attempt to sort of roll out the hybrid MCAS, as they call it now, then let's just call it what it is. Um, I I'm not a supporter of PARC um, for various reasons. Um, I'm more in line and more supportive of MCAS and I think it gives us uh, an opportunity to compare ourselves to data that we have previous um, and so I think we get a better benchmark or gauge ourselves better. I understand the argument for PARC supposedly better aligned with Common Core. I understand that but I just I'm going to support the motion because I think it still holds on to MCAS as a, as a concept. I think it sends a message that local districts like Fall River want to continue with MCAS as opposed to PARC. So I'll support it, but I'm concerned that it's the department's way of saying, well, you can still <clears throat> vote to do MCAS. However, we're going to push a little PARC on you, whether you, know, you like it or not. And, and that's where my concern comes in, because I really wish if that was their intent, they would tell us you can either roll out PARC or you can have the hybrid MCAS park as we've recently voted on, because I really think that that's what they're trying to pull here. But in any event, I, I, I understand your position in not having uh, enough information or guidance from them, um, but I wanted to make my comments clear on the record that I think this is their attempt of rolling out this hybrid without districts even realizing that that's what they're attempting to do. Um, but because it holds, um, hopefully, a majority of the, the MCAS concept to it, um, I certainly will uh, be supportive of it. With that, I yield, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, before I ask a couple of questions, would our student delegates care to uh, ask questions or give their views? 
or not. Go ahead. Yes. Um, on the topic of um, MCAS versus right. Park. Yes, actually, I agree, and um, I really appreciate the, the fact that you guys actually want to. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you for recognizing me. And second off, I want to say that I appreciate the fact that you want to keep MCAS because that's what we're most familiar with. I think I remember taking this back in 2000, since 2005. And um, it's just, it just feels right. Just like, you know, just a sudden change, it wouldn't, it wouldn't feel right for us. I think that this is best for the student body. I think a lot of everybody would else would agree. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to echo what he said, um, MCAS is something that's been practiced. I know I've been taking it since third grade all the way through 10th grade, so it's something that students are familiar with throughout their elementary and high school careers. So, uh, Dr. Roy, anyone else? Um, <clears throat> is it accurate to say that there are over 200, if there are 350 cities and towns, there are over, at least over 200 school districts in Massachusetts? Would stand to reason. Yes. <laughs> yes. So how many how many have um, gone to park? Would you know? It's, it's oh, 50, 50. Fi yeah. Oh, that many. Mm -hmm. And there are about 320 districts in okay. Massachusetts. Yeah. Okay. So um, the school departments, the, the 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 supporters of park. If you were to summarize their point of view, those 160 school districts and supporters throughout the mm -hmm. state, what what would they say? Mm -hmm. Well. Puck originally came about um, from a backwards design model about college and career readiness. And so what we're finding is that, especially at the 10th grade level, you can pass MCAS, be proficient or advanced, and still not necessarily be ready for co uh, college credit bearing coursework. So with the new Common Core State Standards, which sort of, sort of shows where you should be in order to be college and career ready at every given grade level, came a new assessment. And so the proponents of, of PARC are saying this is a better measure of college readiness um, than the existing assessment. Now, you can agree or disagree, but I believe that was the argument and the, the impetus behind, behind the change, besides the fact that we would like something unified <laughs> across the, the country instead of Massachusetts having one test and Rhode Island having another. I think that was the other thing around the commonality of it all. So, say the very last thing you said again as far as the, across the country. Mm. This, this, this debate is or is not taking place in states across the country. Uh, originally, I believe this was coming out of our governor's council and superintendent, please help me out here, where you could be in Massachusetts, which is always considered to have this high level set of standards and have the assessment system, assessment system go with it, but then you could be in another state where the standards are not the same. And so I think it was, coming, for some reason, I think the National Governor's Council was coming out with the idea that uh, this idea of a national exam, possibly, right? So then we, we kind of get it, and the race to the top money came with the new standards, and um, it was a way to have more of a national exam. And um, as you see, it didn't play out that way in Massachusetts as they voted for the hybrid version. I see. So. With that in mind, to put our student delegates on the spot, so if the, if the, if the ideal of PARC is college readiness, your, your um, resistance to it is, is based upon what? After hearing, after hearing what she said, honestly, that does sound like that would be um, something good for us. At the same time, honestly, change, change can be scary, so maybe that's what we're feeling. Yep. Maybe that's what everyone's going to feel, but if it's going to help us, you know, for career readiness, college readiness, I think that would be good for us. And Mr. Vice Chairman, to put, to, to definitely put you on the spot <laughs> with affection, your, 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 your um, objection would be what? If, this, if the ideal is college readiness, and this is, I, I, I get the feeling this is something that is being promoted by the present White House Administration, Secretary of Education behind this, or, or no? become a state level decision. I um, see. So I think it's differentiated by, by the states. I see. So, the, the, I'm just. I'm not buying it. <laughs> I think it's a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of background, depending again, how, you, how many articles, um, or which articles you read. Um, you know, I know one thing in particular is that um, Park is heavily reliant on um, technology and computers, and I know that districts like Fall River and others, although we do make substantial investments in our technology, which will hopefully assist if Park becomes the method of choice. But 
Um, I know that's been a, 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 a point of concern for a district such as Fall River that um, have any opportunity to utilize elect, uh, the electronic piece of taking the park as opposed to paper and pen. I know there's been some drawbacks. My understanding also is that the schools that took the park um, this most recent time didn't see uh, much of a significant change um, in, in uh, I guess some of the, the benchmarks that were set out or some of the data didn't show um, that the test um, was, was uh, drew out the information that, that districts were looking for, at least initially. So I think there were some mixed reviews from districts that actually chose the park over MCAS. Um, you know, I, I stated the reasons why I thought MCAS, um, although it does look as though when students are getting to college that there may be some areas that there are deficient in. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a direct result of the curriculum or the, the measuring tool we use. Um, so I guess that discussion could uh, be had as well. But, you know, I think my issue is that typically what happens is that, you know, whether it's at the federal level or at the state level, um, there are a number of assessment tools that are put out and districts are uh, tasked with using them to measure um, whether or not students are achieving. And my issue with it is that regardless of what is used, it always seems as though whenever the benchmark is in met, that they just come up with a change. And it seems to me as though park is just another flavor that they're looking to, to transition to. Um, you know, MCAS for a long time, um, seemed to be doing what we all wanted it to do. And now all of a sudden, um, there is a group of people that suggest that somehow it doesn't um, prepare students or it doesn't give us enough information um, for students to be um, gauge, to gauge or assess whether or not students are uh, successful uh, in college or career ready. Um, huh. I'm just, you know, I, I, those types of things. Standardized testing, I, I believe, has its place. However, I think we've become over-reliant on standardized testing um, as a whole in the Commonwealth, and I think um, we can still get to the same end result if we didn't put such an emphasis um, that we do on uh, standardized testing. Thank you. The cost issue is an interesting one. Is there, once again, um, I don't know whether you have this information, but among the more affluent school districts, is there a tendency towards park as opposed to the districts that face greater fiscal challenges um, and don't have the same tech, technological resources, uh, uh, is there a, a tendency to stay with MCAS? Uh, is, that part of the, is that part of the debate? Um, I'd have to get you, I, I really don't know, I'd have to get you that information. I wouldn't say not necessarily because uh, right now you had the choice to take PARC either by a computer online or you could take the paper-based exam. However, I, you, you also should know that uh, this, the department is informing us that by 2019, whatever they call this test, MCAS hybrid, they are trying to move by 2019 to a computer-based assessment system, regardless of if it's PARC, MCAS, MCAS hybrid. Uh, that, that's right now the information they're giving us. Mr. Vice Chairman. And, and my question, Dr. Roy, then, is have they outlined the funding source for how they're going to compensate <laughs> districts for such a move? I don't believe they have. They haven't. <laughs> well, I, I, and, and I didn't want to put you on the yeah. spot, but I knew the answer. Was, I should have asked it sort of rhetorically, but um, they don't, and, and that and lies the problem. You know, it's another mandate mm -hmm. that's not followed with the funding necessary to make it successful. Uh, and there's the rub for me on another level that, you know, you can't continue to push s these assessments and these mandates on districts, strip them of their local control, and then say, find a way to fund it. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it's just wholly unfair for districts such as Fall River and other gateway cities where we're struggling to meet what's at least minimally required to educate our students. So I, 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 trust me, I, I'm all in favor of high standards. I just think the, the way we get to that sometimes is just unfair. And if the state wants to come up with um, you know, resources or, or um, wants to lay out for districts like Fall River how they plan on assisting us, with me achieving these goals, then I'd like to hear that. But typically it's, we'll just giving you the heads up, by 2019, we're gonna to go to a computer-based system and we're expecting that you do that. Um, and we're left holding the bag, trying to figure out how we're gonna balance that 
with all our all of our other needs here in the district. So um, I, I figured that was going to be the response, but I just wanted it to be clear that um, oftentimes it's a mandate that doesn't come with the necessary funding to achieve it. I yield. Mr. Andre. Just a quick item. Also, uh, in terms of park that uh, that hasn't been mentioned, and that is the, the you know, we talked about money. Uh, there's also the issue of time. Uh, park takes longer to, to, uh, to administer than, uh, than the MCAS does. Right now, teachers complain about the time that, uh, that the testing takes away from uh, their opportunity to, uh, to actually instruct the students. Well, they'll have even less time with Park. Um, Mr. Android, for clarification, uh, POC is a time test and MCAS is untimed. So I'm not sure where you're getting that information from, but, but given that there's time constraints for POC and there's some, I think 6% of the students in the state reported they felt they didn't have enough time um, to, to finish the test. I don't understand why, I, why I that don't would necessarily be I don't think it's case. in terms of how many hours per day or whatever, it's in terms of how many uh, uh, how many days are uh, involved with the, with the park? That's how, how I understood it. Uh, initially, also, I, I think that the I'm not sure that the the park is timed initially. It with it is as time. you go on, no, it's, it, time. It yes. it, it's absolutely time. There's a time limit for those uh, sessions, and MCAS is untimed. That's one of the uh, the key differences. Thank you. Ms. Panzer, I, I wasn't going to talk, but <laughs> um, since you brought it up, I just wanted to let you know that. Um, and I Googled it because I didn't remember the numbers, but um, there were 25 states that had signed on to park at one time. There are eight states left mm -hmm. in the park. So that's very telling to me. So why do, would we want to get into something? I think the best course of action for us is to stay with MCAS, continue backing the MTA and the, and the people that are really fighting it because we'd be in park no questions asked if it wasn't for the Mass Teachers Association, people like Rebecca that have really been vocal about um, not going into park. And if that continues, um, maybe this hybrid can be less parkish than we think it's going to be um, with their leadership. So I, I wanted you to know that. And uh, my concern with the technology isn't as much that we can't afford it. I think we made a significant investment last year in technology that would probably allow us to have our students taking the park test. But my concern is that um, students in more suburban areas go home at night and have access to computers and are really uh, functioning well on computers. And while our students have access to them in school, it's not the same kind of practice. And the park is a time test, as Dr. Roy said. And my concern would, is going to be that our students are going to be able to really express what they've learned on a time test using technology when they don't have the access at home that um, other students around the state have. So um, I'm certainly um, going to be supporting MCAS and um, vocal about trying to um, you know, keep it more like MCAS. I understand the rigor part of it, but there are uh, parts of it that just really isn't acceptable to me. So that's I it. think those are two superb points, the decrease from 25 states using PARC to eight, and then also the, um, the delineation that you made between the suburban communities where kids go home and they have much greater access to technology than, than uh, a lot of our kids in, um, in gateway cities do. So those are great points. Thank you very much for speaking up about them. Anybody else? Yes, Mr. Martins. I think uh, part of the uh, having the moratorium on high stakes testing for three years of that, that house bill is uh, to also uh, look into the issue of cost. Uh, in there so that it's not becoming a an unfunded mandate Are you Anyone else? Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Roy Oh, oh. 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 So we're take a vote on. Okay. There's a motion and a second on the Okay. On the motion, Mr. Chair. This is, this is a, uh, Madam Secretary, you spell out exactly what the vote is going to be about, the motion? To remain with MCAS for okay, the 2016-17 <clears throat> school year. Okay. Roll call vote. Mr. Andre? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mr. Maynard? Yes. Mrs. Panchley? Yes. Mayor Sutter? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Roy. Next. <laughs> Discussion and vote to approve converting grades one through five report cards. Motion to approve. Second it. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Martins. Um, 
I, last time I asked uh, for uh, your parental input uh, into the, um, you know, into the, the converting the grades for report cards to trimesters. Um, as I went through this information, uh, I didn't see anything that indicate the number of parents that responded or what. Uh, was that taken into consideration? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's in there. Uh, it's in there, Mr. Martins. At the time that I had written this memo, which was, I believe, on uh, I don't know Thursday or Friday, we we had 299 parents uh, responded that they would prefer the move to trimesters, and 142 said they'd prefer to keep the terms. Since then, I asked Mr. Michael Lazak to give me an update as of Monday morning. As of this morning, 437 uh, parents prefer option one, which is the move to trimesters, and 213 prefer option two, which is to keep the quarters. Thank you. I yield. Any further, any other discussion on this? Uh, Dr. Roy, if I may, um, <clears throat> so that's a sample of, I don't know, around 7% of the parents. Uh, 600 plus, 10,000 kids? Elementary. Uh, this is just grades one to oh, five. Oh, elementary. Oh, just and elementary. And I only see. grades one I to see, five. I see, I see, yeah. I see. So it's, oh. Um, are, you, are you satisfied that that's a, that's a, that's a good enough sample, parents? I, I think it's a much larger sample than when we normally survey parents. So um, I'm pleased that actually this methodology, uh, using technology to get these responsive, uh, responses, uh, got us more input than we normally would get. Oh, um, do you know the number of uh, elementary school children? Well, it's probably about six, four thousand, eight hundred times. Okay. I mean, again, it's times. grades yeah. one through five. If yeah. you figure of approximately eight hundred students, give or take, per grade level. But parents have multiple kids, so right. you know that would be smaller yeah. than that number. Okay. <clears throat> any any further discussion on this? Um, roll call vote. Yep. Mr. Andrade. Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Martins? <coughs> yes. Mr. Maynard? Yes. Mrs. Panchley? Yes. Mayor Sutter? Yes. Item three. Mr. Coogan, discussion and vote to approve AAA driver training, partnership with Durfee. Motion to accept. Second. Any discussion? Mr. Coogan, anything to report? In case you need a anybody, Anyone else? Yes. Uh, do we have anybody doing that now? Do I have in school? Not currently, no, sir. No? Uh, and when is this going to be taken? After school or during school hours? Not during school hours, but they would make it available at multiple uh, scenarios during the year. For example, they may run it a couple times a week for a short period of time in order to get the classroom hours that are needed for that course. Uh, they may run it on a Saturday session so that students who are not available during the week because of a job or something could go on multiple Saturdays the way similar uh, uh, local driving schools run this, this type of a program. Uh, it's a nationally uh, recognized program as far as the, you know, the, the, the curriculum and the, the, skill, the skill sets that they deliver in the classroom. If we never had this before, what makes you want to give it to them now? Well, it's something that's certainly a necessary uh, um, program that's needed for high school students as they try to get their licenses. Uh, it's a matter of convenience to the students and their families that they could take it either after school or on the weekends at a known location. If they wish to continue on with driving uh, road lessons, uh, AAA does offer that option. Uh, they've, they've agreed to work with our families in terms of financing any cost for the school. And although their program does provide for a small rental fee, I asked AAA if they would work with us so that we didn't incur any cost to open buildings or do anything out of the ordinary, and then they could uh, trade that off for a, a reduction in fees to the students, and, and they agreed to do that if we decide to go with the program. Is uh, AAA Driver School going to give us the school department anything for having us in the school system? No, they do offer a rental fee, but I, I, I suggested that we have the rental fee, as long as we were not out of pocket for expenses, applied to the cost of the course for the families so that the families could get a little break on the, on the cost of getting kids their permits and licenses. I yield, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, Ms. Forcier. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I was just going to say, I remember going back to when I was 16 and getting my permit and going to driving school. I thought, like, I wish the school had something after school that I could take because I ended up going to driving school at night um, from, like, 6 to 9, and it took away time from my homework and after school activities. So I think it's a great um, thing that Durfee would offer to students. Thank you. I yield. Um, I'd just like to say um, I agree with everything she's saying. I mean, I remember back when I had to take my job, um, go to driving school and take all these lessons. It just really cut into my hours. So I think this is a great idea. Excellent. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Next is custodial services for the uh, FRPS Nutrition Food Service Program. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Yes. Uh, what, in essence, you're asking for is five additional staff. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Uh, and basically, uh, you, you have uh, overtime averaging uh, 26, 27 hours was that per week? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's closer to uh, 26, 27,000 per pay period. 27,000? Yes, on an average for the entire year. Some, some, months is uh, some weeks is lower than others. It basically amounts to this. We have a shortage of custodians to cover the areas that need to be cleaned. If we were able to add bodies at a cost neutral uh, impact to the operating budget, it would reduce potentially the amount of overtime that we incur, which has to be offered so that we can get those bathrooms and classrooms and other areas covered when we're short staffed. Uh, what is the, uh, when I'm reading this, I'm reading what you put down. Okay. Right? And uh, averaging 26, 27 hours, but it didn't say 1,000. Uh, nevertheless, uh, is there a, what is the approximate cost of that? The cost, approximate cost of what? The, the overtime. So, without getting to a you know too, too fine a level of detail, when a uh, when a custodian is out and we do not have a spare custodian to put in that area, we then cover it with overtime. I understand that. So, uh, uh, an eight-hour shift is covered with a three-hour shift, which is paid at a premium because it's done with overtime. Yep. So um, the, the approximate cost to cover three hours of overtime is somewhere between $75 and $90. Okay. All right. Who cleans the kitchens now? Currently, it's done with custodial staff, which is paid with custodial dollars out of the operating budget. If we were to shift the cost of that staff to the nutrition department, which is an allowable expense under the terms of the National School Lunch Program grant, we're shifting cost off of the operating budget to the cafeteria budget, and then you would be able to backfill the position in the operating budget and therefore have more bodies available and reduce the overtime. Right. But for one, I don't know why uh, the um, food service was not charged for uh, custodial services and cleaning it. Can I respond to that? I'm sorry? Can I respond to that? Sure. Okay. In order for it to be an allowable expense, under the National School Lunch Program, that individual has to be fully, uh, they don't like to apportion costs, fully available to the nutrition program for the eight hours that they work. They would have to be basically, in essence, employed in the service of the nutrition program. Some of the areas that we're talking about shifting here, those several areas, they do split duties. They may be part of the duty in the cafeteria and part of the duty elsewhere in the school. What this would involve is a realignment of those areas so that their, their hours are devoted to the cafeteria area and that way, cafeteria and kitchen area, and that way we can go ahead and capture that within the cost of the lunch program. I fully understand that. But what I'm saying here is that yep. the, the cafeteria kitchen and the cafeteria uh, itself, the tables, the, the, the eating area, uh, that's the hottest job of a custodian. Would you agree? Um, yes, there versus, are parts of versus cleaning a classroom or a series of classroom. Uh, you have about twenty to twenty-five thousand square feet. 
uh, you know, of, of classroom space uh, and a corridor, of course. Corridors, uh, elevators, and, classrooms. Right. Yes. Yeah, absolutely so. Uh, but the, would you agree that the uh, food service area uh, is a more difficult job than the custodian cleaning out uh, um, classrooms and stuff like that? Uh, I'll certainly concede the point that you're making. However, I do want to point something out. Ten of our facilities are, are done on a satellite basis, which means they're not cooking kitchens. So essentially you have the cafeteria, which is floors and tables mostly, trash removal. And the mess, if you will, from the serving is, is pretty much confined to the catering operation, which is set up and taken down every day. So that's less of, a, of an impact on the, on the facility. Those areas that, that cook, particularly Durfee High School, I mean, you've got probably close to 4,000, 5,000 square feet of kitchen area there that is, is a bear to clean. That's, that's certainly a task, yes. Who cleans the grease traps? Uh, usually, around the grease traps is cleaned by our custodians. If we need to have a company come in and service and remove that, that's done by a contracted service. I'm well aware of uh, cleaning uh, the food service areas of a school uh, in there. What I see here, however, is that I, uh, I'm somewhat disappointed that the, uh, the charge to the food service account wasn't made long ago. And the fact that that would now then, you still have net school spending to, to do, that would free up additional monies to be put into wherever you wanted to put them, put it inside the budget lines uh, in there. But uh, you have five, you're asking for five additional custodians. Right? It doesn't matter where the, uh, uh, for, uh, the source of funds come from. It could be the monies for food service, it could be the regular budget, it doesn't matter. They're in the same union, they're still in, and they're getting whatever rages that they earn on the steps. Uh, in there. So the, the uh, uh, source of funds is immaterial. Um, but you know, you're, you're asking for five additional people uh, in there. Uh, it seems like you're increasing the total number of custodians that you have uh, in there. But yet the cafeterias are being cleaned right now? On split shifts, yes, yeah. or, or par partially during the day, partially by maybe some of the cafeteria staff during that time. Well, I haven't heard anything in regards to having the Board of Health coming down and saying, hey, this is dirty. No, we're inspected twice a year right. and we pass. Okay. Yes. I, and so, uh, five additional staff, along with fringe benefits, you know, and and the like. Um, that's a good chunk of change, Mr. Martins. If I might point out, by by increasing the number of custodial staff, we're reducing overtime, which currently impacts the operating budget, and frees those dollars up for use elsewhere in the budget. So it really is just a matter of shifting the cost center over making some adjustments so that that shift is allowable under the grant and then freeing up those dollars to, to, to then potentially reduce overtime and make those dollars available elsewhere. Uh, Mr. Coogan, the budget is not necessarily the only thing. You, know, you can't segregate the food service from the budget. That's another source of income and another source of expense uh, in there. So as a result, when you're looking at both, end result is that you're asking for five additional bodies. That's correct. Is that not so? Yes, yes it is. Yeah. Five additional bodies that will be, uh, what, the, say about $40,000 each in salary? Base salary is probably around 32. 32, okay. So that's 150, some, about $160,000 right. uh, in there, plus benefits. Correct. Okay. Uh, in there, that come that come in. Uh, are the benefits going to be charged to uh, the food service? It's included in the memo. Yes. All right. I also uh, found the area you spoke to. I apologize for the for the uh, typo. 
when it says averaging 26 to 27, that, those are dollars per hour for the overtime rate. That's what that 26 to 27. Oh, that's what that is? Correct. I apologize. There's a dollar sign missing from my typing. All right. Uh, and, uh, I yield. Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Coogan. Good evening. What are you estimating the overtime cost to be now? Mr. Uh, Almeida would, would potentially be able to give you a better cost. I'm giving you a cost of, of <clears throat> custodial maintenance overtime for mm -hmm. a, a, an average uh, pay period, which is a two-week period. It's about somewhere in the 20s. Well, someone thought this was going to be a cost-saving or cost-neutral move, correct? So well, someone knew how much it was costing in potential overtime in order to figure that out, right? I could give you a year-to-date figure. Um, I could get that Proximate. to the committee. Again, uh, if you talk, uh, you know, roughly $20,000 per week, knowing there's higher and lower weeks, uh, we're down to probably the last couple of weeks of the year. I would say we're probably somewhere in the 470, 480 range, gross, gross for, the, for the year. In overtime? Yes. That's just for... That's custodial and maintenance. But. And maintenance. Okay, so that's separate from, all right. The next question I have is, because I'm trying to flush this out, because I understand the need for more bodies, but it's because we have people who aren't in their workplace. How many employees are maxed out at their number of sick time? So they're given by contract the number of sick days. How many are maxed out on those sick days? Uh, I would say we're probably... Uh, for the year, I couldn't give you the exact figure off the top of my head. There are approximately 30, uh, 30 to 32 employees who are currently on what we call our monitoring plan, which means that they now have to supply medical uh, notes for their use of sick time to make sure that it's justified. And how many get on a monitoring plan? How do you get on a monitoring plan? How many sick days of the allotted sick days do you need to use? Contractually, uh, using a per uh, 12 or more in a one-year period or a pattern that raises the suspicion that Somebody's missing. So they get a total of how many? Is they get a total of uh, 15 currently. 15. So if they use 12, they go on a monitoring plan? Correct. Okay. And you said there are 30 or 32 out of your 87 employees? Uh, closer to 100 when you count the maintenance people. Close to 100 staff? Close to 100 staff. <clears throat> so about 30%. Roughly, yes. Already at almost their max in sick days. Or have exhibited a pattern of high Or usage. exhibited a pattern. See, that, that, that's where it becomes an issue for me. Because just putting on five more bodies doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to... I, I'm wondering if this is more of a management issue with abuse of sick time than it is a need for more bodies to account for the overtime that's being allotted for those people who are out. Well, if I might address that, in our last bargaining uh, agreement, uh, the 15 is uh, for those legacy employees, and that's approximately 80 mm -hmm. of the uh, 87 or 88 uh, custodians we reference. Mm -hmm. All the new ones come in at 12 days. So mm -hmm. we've already brought that number down to try to reduce that potential impact to, to the operating budget. But those employees that were not on board at the time that shift was made, they still get the, the 15, right. the additional three days. And, and I don't necessarily have an issue with more bodies to account for the work that needs to get done. But if you're going to put five more bodies on, it's just going to become five more people who now have 12 sick days to 15 sick days to use. Certainly. And they now become part of this rotation where you take tomorrow off and I'll get some overtime and then I'll take the next day off and you get some overtime. It's not going to work. We're never going to address the issue of overtime if we're just putting bodies there and not accounting for the people who are abusing their sick time. And I'm not saying, it just strikes me that 30 or 32 or 30 percent of your staffing right now is either on a monitoring plan or have maxed out on their sick days and we haven't even made it to Christmas yet. So three months in to a school year, September to now. Well, well the, th the 32 are on a rolling plan, so it's, a, it's on 12 months. We review that quarterly. Right. So some people that have sort of uh, gotten better about their attendance may come off that plan and people right. are on it, so the, the 32 that are on it are on, not just on it because of what's happened between September and now. Mm -hmm. That's on a rolling basis. They're added or, or dropped off that plan. But there's an issue there. Oh, we Or they would be on the plan. And we absolutely... So whether or not they've d d displayed issues of abusing sick time this current year or in the past, they've been identified as an individual that we need to keep an eye on, or they need to provide sufficient medical documentation to support their absence. 
Yes. You know, I understand we're spending a lot of money on overtime, and, and I think notwithstanding the fact that we have as many people as we are using the maximum amount of sick days, I'm not sure that five additional bodies is going to impact that. We're essentially going to put five people on at a cost, 160,000 plus fringe benefits. Okay, so that'll drop our exposure and overtime somewhat until mm -hmm those individuals start using time, and then we're back to paying overtime. Well, certainly our ability to cover and make sure that the areas are properly cleaned, bathrooms, kept classrooms, et cetera, is going to be better staffed. So that reduces some exposure to us there. But in addition, as new people come into the system, the program we put in place, we have seen a decrease over the last 24 months in the use of sick time. So it does appear to be having an effect, although it's not a dramatic effect. It's not, it's not a you know, night and day type thing, but we do see movement. Right, and they have less days. Mm -hmm. So the hope would be if you have less days, then you have less to use. So we Typ would ho hopefully see a, a Typically, a we don't see as much usage in the, in the newer workforce. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I yield. Ms. Pansley. Hi, <clears throat> thank you. Um, you went over with this with me two years ago when I first came on the school committee, but I need a refresher course. So if we put on five new people and everyone has their assignments and people call in sick, you can't just spread people out during the regular hours to cover, correct? No, by their bargaining agreement, they bid in two areas and they work within their area. If they're not in their area and we assign somebody to work elsewhere, they still have to do their area at eight hours and the additional area is we incur three hours of overtime to send them into that area. So it's not as simple as bringing on five new people and then as they Spread. call in sick or other people call in sick, we have more people to do the work because we would still have to pay overtime if one of the new employees or the old employees called in. But, but in absentee, but in absence, in the, in the current configuration that we have, we're exposed in more areas where we have less, less people. So we're constantly feeding overtime into the buildings try to make sure that the buildings are properly clean for the next day. Because we have more than one person in a building, so if there's five people in a building and one calls in sick, do we have to bring in someone on overtime to cover this area in that building, or do the other four people do the work? No, the other four, the other four people may do the building on that area on overtime, but those other four people have their assigned areas to clean. Right, so, right, so yeah, so, so, so we're still going to be paying the same. So I, I'm just saying, if we had five people on, then we're, we're making the area smaller because we have five extra, we're not making no. the area smaller? No, we have vacancies. We currently have vacancies, um. which we're rotating people through. We have a small amount of part-time employees that we can assign to open areas mm -hmm. as, they're, as they're uncovered. If somebody's on vacation or you know, taking a personal day or out on an injury of some kind. Uh, and then we, we have areas where people have just between vacation, sick time, other time, if they're out and we don't have enough of those spare, spare workers, then we need to assign overtime. We have to put somebody in the area to service it so it's ready for kids the next day. Right. I'm still confused. Okay. <laughs> so so I, I'd certainly like to come to you and just say, you know, I, I need more manpower to, to, to clean the areas that we have. The proposal involves shifting some of the cost away from the operating budget, so it's cost neutral to the budget, and then backfilling those positions with some additional bodies, which gives us more man hours to be able to clean, or <coughs> staff hours to be able to clean. When I read it, at fir at first I, it made sense to me. <laughs> then questioning the overtime part of it, I, I just can't, I guess, get clear in my head um, how much we're going to save on overtime because in my mind, the way I understand it, and maybe I'm not understanding it right, is that as people call it sick, that we're still going to be putting, paying people overtime because they're going to be in a new area. They, because no matter what, it's an area that they're not responsible for. But you would have less areas to cover with more staff available to cover. Okay, so less time? But yes, there's a time limit time. too, right? Like you, if you call in someone to do an area, is there like a two hour or three hour minimum or something? It's a three hour minimum, yes. Three hour minimum. And, and if you clean an area that normally takes eight hours to clean on three hours, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, you're not doing as thorough a cleaning job. So right. typically what happens after two or three, if it's the same area, yeah. multiple nights in a row, if it's, if it's a one-off, yeah. somebody's out on a Tuesday and then they come back on Wednesday, 
you can shortchange that area for a day. Mm -hmm. But if you want it sanitized, sometimes you have to put a, an extra guy on that second or third night to make sure that you get the, you know, the area properly prepared. Okay. Knowing that, you know, Mr. Almeida understands, you know, the budget issues that, that we're potentially having that we'll be talking about later in the meeting, um, you know, and knowing that he knows the finances, I have to assume that you, um, you know, that you know that the overtime will be less and by shifting money over to the nutrition program that it will be a cost savings in the operating budget or we wouldn't That's the goal. be doing this. That's the goal. Okay, I yield. And the projected savings from this new approach? Well, again, I, I don't have a hard number on it that I can say based on a historical figure, but any of the overtime that we can reduce, okay, is coming at approximately cost of $27 an hour. So five hours, five staff people at 40 hours a week, you're reducing a potential 200 hours per, per week from overtime. Anyone else? I would also like to point out to Mr. Martin's point or earlier, uh, when it comes to shifting costs, over the last several years, as the uh, nutrition program has gotten healthier, uh, we've begun to shift off utility costs, supply costs that were typically picked up through the operating budget before. So there's been a number of factors that impact the operating budget that we've been shifting over as the program has gotten healthier to be able to reduce some of the, lo the load on the operating budget and reuse those dollars elsewhere. So, okay. Uh, Madam Secretary. Mr. Andre? Yes. Mr. Costa? No. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Martins? No. Mr. Maynard? I abstain. Mrs. Panchley? Yes. Mayor Sutter? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Next, Mr. Almeida, spending plan to address shortfall in health care line item. If I could introduce this as Mr. Almeida is coming to the podium, um, I would direct school committee members to the memo from uh, Mr. Uh, Almeida that's in your school committee binders, um, noting that we're coming back to the committee after an initial discussion regarding the $2.3 million projected shortfall in the health uh, insurance line item, and just again for the um, public's information, the health care line item sits outside of the school department's operating budget. Uh, and so, however, since the health care line item is, in, uh, is within the fiscal responsibility of the school committee, we do need to present um, recommendations and options for the school committee to consider to um, close the shortfall, close, uh, close that gap in the health care line item we're approximately um, just about 50% through the fiscal year. Um, Mr. Almeida continues to monitor um, our health insurance costs. We have had a meeting. Uh, Mr. Almeida has met um, with city representatives and others. Um, what we know to date is that um, the health care for our retirees is what is driving up the cost, um, specifically around such things as cancer treatments and pharmaceuticals for specific um, medical conditions. So our active or current employees, those health healthcare costs seem to be stable. It's the retiree health care that the school committee is responsible for providing um, those resources. Um, those those uh, claims uh, continue to rise. That said, um, the cover memo details um, the, a, a list of current recommendations to uh, address the shortfall, not in its entirety, but certainly um, the vast uh, majority. You'll see um, that we are proposing to freeze the textbook account. You have a memo in your, in your packet um, from Dr. Roy explaining the implications of that. Um, projected savings in salaries within the operating budget. You have a spreadsheet attached to the memo with yellow highlights. Those, um, those, those highlights indicate positions that we would recommend freezing at this point and can certainly get into that. There is one correction I would ask as you look at your spreadsheet for the highlighted area. The world language teacher leader for Durfee High School should not be highlighted. That position um, has been appointed. 
the third area is the nutrition account, again, shifting to uh, pay the health care benefits for active employees out of the nutrition account. In other words, for our nutrition employees, our food service workers, rather than um, paying them out of, uh, rather than charging that to the um, current line item, that that cost gets shifted to the um, nutrition revolving account. The fourth area, which is uh, on the agenda for later tonight for a greater, uh, more in-depth in, um, discussion, is the um, the increase in the amount um, in addition to the one million that we're expecting that the city needs to fund to uh, meet 100% net school spending. That figure is actually $1.3 million based on our um, projections. So that additional $300,000 $300, um, would go toward this. And then finally, using the remainder of our circuit breaker revolving account funds um, of in, in that amount that you see there um, to uh, assist with the gap closing measures. Those recommendations total a little bit more than $2 million. Mr. Almeida can go into specifics around his uh, calculations, including um, the projected savings in, in salaries with the operating budget. I can tell you as we looked um, at the areas of the current vacancies, and that's the spreadsheet you have before you, you'll see we listed the funding source. Um, so these aren't just operating budget um, positions, but we wanted the committee to see that um, we have a number of vacancies that are um, funded through um, either revolving accounts or grant funds. Obviously, um, we're not projecting that we close or freeze any of those. So it's not a complete freeze across the district. Um, we tried to be um, um, strategic in terms of for example, I will say that their uh, department head for math is one of the positions we propose freezing. At this juncture in the school year, it is highly, highly unlikely that we would fill that position anyway um, with, a, with a department head who has the uh, licensures and, uh, licensure and um, necessary qualifications to be a math department head. So that's how um, we went through that. Mr. Almeida also took, uh, which he can again explain his calculations, um, in 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 um, compiling the information there within overall in the salary uh, account. Thank you. Before Mr. Almeida speaks, Mr. Martins or after? Yes. Before. Okay. You know, I recently uh, was forced to purchase another vehicle, and while I would have liked to buy a brand new one. I simply couldn't afford it, so I had to settle for a used one. Uh, the analogy being is that if I look through your accounts, and they, you have, uh, I'm not in favor of freezing textbook account. Um, even though it's not necessarily, as the material stated, not necessarily a hard copy of a book, but an educational you know, uh, material. You have in your professional development account uh, stipends of uh, unexpended of about one, uh, oh, it looks slightly over one billion dollars, one million dollars right, yes. uh, in there. Why not cut some of that uh, professional development stipends? The, the we, reason being, Mr. Martins, is that, that money there is set aside to pay for the ELT at, at schools like Morton, Doran, uh, understood. Fonseca, and Watson. I want that, a that brand totals new. about 1.1 million of the 1.3 million in the budget. Okay. I want a brand new car. I can't afford it, so I have to go with a used car. Right. Well, it's nice to have that, but the money comes from someplace uh, in there. Now, granted that they are salaries of people, absolutely so, but they still have their primary job. Right. You have to cut back uh, on there. And uh, you know, rather than cutting back on student activities, or, and I don't mean base basketball, I mean uh, student functions, the expenditure, uh, why not cut back on that 
and I used a, a portion of the uh, professional development stipend to make up the deficit that we have to pay. Mr. Martins, I just a clarifying question because your microphone cut out a little bit. So are you suggesting that we no longer fund expanded learning time for a number of our schools? Is that, is that the cost cutting measure that you're suggesting? I just couldn't, couldn't catch all of it. At this point in time, you have to give up something. I'm just asking Ms. Martins the if that's your recommendation. Yes. Okay. The answer is okay. yes. So if, right. I, so if I can just add in, if, if that were the case, Mr. Martins, we have various bus con contracts that have tiering routes. You would, in, in essence, mess up the tiering there, so we'd have to pay a higher cost to bus our kids to school. Why would you have to pay a higher cost? Because you'd have to go from a route where one, uh, one bus will do two schools to a route where a bus will probably can only do one yeah, school. You're talking about busing? Yes. Yeah. That, that has a cause and effect when you change the ELT arrangement I, uh, that we have right now. But if you're not utilizing, uh, I don't know what your contracts say as far as the clauses, but if you no longer need it, you mean to say you have to keep paying it? You're still going to need to pay the bus routes, Mr. Marins. You go, you're, you're, what you're doing is you're changing the, the end times of the school. Yeah, you're changing the bus route and to so a, we currently have a time of the day. We, but we currently have a structure where we bus kids to and from schools at certain times. That's going to change the times, and it could have conflicts with other schools. So we're going to have to change the way we, you know, we do our yeah. routes there. Yeah. Same thing. I want a brand new one. I can't afford it. I have to settle for a used vehicle. At this time, uh, Mr. Martins, I'm, I'm providing you um, a, cost a cost savings measure that doesn't affect, that isn't affecting the current staff that we have in place. Yeah. Mr. Almeida, could you just, for the committee's clarification, which of the schools would be impacted by the operating budget no longer funding expanded learning time? Sure. The schools, the schools that you were talking about are Morton, Doran, Fonseca, and Watson. These are, these are all good programs, guaranteed. They're all great, but they have to be paid for. We're finding ourselves in a deficit. Right? So what can we give up without affecting the uh, you know, other areas? Now, it's always going to affect some other areas, I guess. But nevertheless, uh, you know, is freezing textbooks uh, going to is that the best option? $200,000? Uh, or is it better to um, you know, decrease the stipends that are being paid? Do we need to have, like, can we knock it off so that you're, you're going, uh, instead of five days a week, you're going four days a week? Well, the, sti the stipends would probably have to be renegotiated, Mr. Martins. I'm sorry? The stipends would have to be renegotiated. They're part of the um, part collective of the bargaining agreement. But they're on an hourly basis, are they not? No. no. In other words, if a, if a teacher is working by collective bargaining <clears throat> agreement, if a teacher is working an additional 30 minutes, it's a $4,000 stipend. Additional 60 minutes is an $8,000 stipend. An additional 90 minutes is a, an additional $12,000 stipend. Fine. And if you, and is that, uh, is uh, that on a per day, or is that on a per week, or what? That's annual, Mr. Martins. Annual. All right, so if you cut back on that, uh, you're, you're telling me that you can't cut back. We could cut back, and I would appreciate some guidance from the committee. If the committee uh, wants to go in this direction, um, I, we would, could certainly calc uh, Mr. Mar um, Mr. Almeida is saying it's a $1 million savings to eliminate the ELT at these four schools. <laughs> I didn't, you know, let me, let me correct something here. I didn't say eliminate it. We need $200,000. I'm saying, why do we have to take it out of textbook? Why can't we lower <clears throat> these stipends by $200,000? Well, then you would need to determine which school you wanted to impact um, by $200,000. And then I think as uh, what Mr. Almeida is trying, is explaining, is that that's going to have an impact on our transportation contracts because Mr. Coogan, who could speak to this, has tiered um, the, our buses based on dismissal, arrival and dismissal times of these schools. So you'd have to make a determination, is there a liability now with transportation because you're changing the beginning and end times of schools? 
All right. uh, Mr. Chair, I yield. I had my say, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, now if others have questions, fine. So I say to everybody, shouldn't we hear Mr. Almeida's report first before we start to chime in with questions and discussion? So that, that's what I would sure. like to do. Go, go ahead, Mr. Almeida. Thank you. Um, so as, as the superintendent in indicated, <clears throat> I'm currently projecting a $2.3 million shortfall in the, the health insurance line. That shortfall, in essence, is in addition to the million that the city had committed to uh, paying us before the end of the year. So if we were not to receive the money from the city before the end of the year, we'd be looking at $3.3 million and not $2.3 million. If, if I could just interject here, and I hope I'm not contradicting myself as a result of what I just said, but I thought that that million was actually a number that had not been agreed upon. I thought that was a number that there was some debate about. I thought that resulted from the overestimation of health costs in FY15. You are, you are, you're correct. Okay. Man, you're correct. So that million, um, this is the second time I've heard this today, that's being presented from you right now as if that's a flat, agreed upon figure, and it's, I it's, was not under that impression. I, I apologize if I okay. mentioned that way. It's, I'm correct on that, it's, right? It's right. this million plus this 300,000. Okay. Correct. Okay, please correct. continue, yep. And so, you know, in, in, in my memo to you, I, I outlined five items, uh, as the superintendent mentioned, that total nearly $2.1 million <clears throat> to make up the shortfall of the $2.3 million. And um, with that being said, I'll open it up to questions. Okay. Um, I have a few, but Mr. Andrade, we'll go. Uh, I like had look. read through uh, Dr. Roy's report on, uh, on the, the impact of, uh, of cutting back the, on the, the textbooks, and uh, I, I did remember that uh, she had indicated that uh, most of the, the uh, textbooks were not actually textbooks, but they, I, I believe they were, they were licenses, software licenses. Yes. But, the, but the, the point that she made that seemed to, uh, to really um, uh, make a, a real impact was that the savings actually would come from not putting uh, project lead the way at the middle grades. Apparently, it's not then. You do not have that program there now. Is that correct? Uh, we do have it. Um, we would use, the, if we had extra funds, we would expand it. More and is the uh, the school using their expanded learning time very well uh, that has taken advantage of Project Lead the Way in the, in the greatest way across the middle schools. Um, there's less of Project Lead the Way going on at Cuss and even Talbot. Uh, we also talked about expanding Project Lead the Way to the elementary school. So this uh, would be targeted specifically for tech and, and engineering. Um, but as I said in the memo, the core content areas, everyone does have the textbooks they need to meet the learning standards put forth, put forth by the mass frameworks. We all have that. This is an enhancement of STEM, really. So it, it is very desirable, obviously, but it, it's something that right now uh, you're, not, you're not using that you could perhaps put off for, for a year or, or Correct, beyond. correct. Okay. Uh, thank you. Mr. Vice Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Andrade had asked the question that I had with respect because I did note in the memo that it, it mentioned specifically expanding those programs. Um, so at this point, we're not anticipating students are going to go without. Textbooks have been ordered, they're in the classrooms, licenses for technology agreements have been made, students have access to those um, materials as it stands now. So any transfer of monies out of there won't come at any reduced materials this year other than an expansion an expansion excuse me in the middle schools for project lead the way materials as i understood it and, and mr costa to, to your point if we have teachers come forward you know sometimes we hear teachers will need they'd like to purchase a novel set for their classroom or something unique, we can certainly look at other funding sources such as grant funding to accommodate mm -hmm. those specific unique requests. That's fine. I mean, it's not like we had anticipated putting these books in the classroom and then all of a sudden now students are going to go without. We're talking about an expansion at the middle schools that we may have to hold off for another year in order to roll out. Um, I'm certainly in favor of that 
more than I am um, either breaking a contractual agreement that we have with extended learning time um, for schools. Um, certainly, I don't think, I certainly wouldn't be able to support that piece because it does come with implication regarding transportation and that would have a carryover effect in terms of breaking contracts or changing contracts with bus companies about um, adding routes essentially because now you'd need two buses to do the work of one bus um, because you'd have to change the end dates, uh, excuse me, the end time on some of those schools. Um, certainly not a predicament that, you know, want to see the committee in. Um, I appreciate the fact that it's been brought to our attention uh, timely so that we can address it. Um, I do have concerns with leaving professional vacancies open. Um, I, I do know that a number of those are in schools where um, we've seen some progress. For instance, the Carlton uh, Baveras Elementary School uh, proposing to not fill the school administrative management position, Henry Lord Green School. What I did find interesting, though, is that the committee has just gone on record to use Title I funds to offer up three additional teaching positions to Green, but I do notice that one of the positions you're looking to not fill happens to be a literacy coach slash teacher position. So are we back now to still having an issue? Oh, are we going to have an issue with class size there because essentially now it's a net of two instead of three? The three positions in Title I were three teaching positions. You're, you're talking about a literacy coach. It says right. teacher, teacher dash, literacy coach. literacy coach. So essentially so. that teacher is not in the classroom. Right. Correct. So we would have a net of two additional teachers? You get no, three. because well, Green, that, those are Title I funds. Correct. We're not impacting right. no, no. what the committee did previously correct. in terms of reducing class size. Okay. So before we had three Title I positions and one from the operating budget is four, correct? Yes. One, one is a coach. The, th the, th the three well, from Title coach, I were teachers. But are they in the classroom teaching? What are they doing? No, mm -hmm. they're, they're in for professional development. Sometimes they may be going in to do some instruction, but by and large, they're, delivery, they're working with teachers through common planning time, professional development, and um, realistically, we highlighted that because if a school has not found a literacy coach by December, again, it's very unlikely that they will um, identify a literacy coach. Classroom teachers altogether a different story, partic particularly since um, many of our um, colleges and universities are doing December graduations. We tend to pick up some um, teacher candidates through that process. But a literacy coach, um, by its role, requires experience beyond a first-year teacher who may have graduated college. So we're not impacting okay. what the committee did to reduce class size. This was just a, okay. this was a coaching position. So it's a coaching position that at this point we're not going to be able to fill given the time of year. Correct. Correct. Which leads me to my next question. If we can survive from November or December through the end of the year not filling that position, then maybe next year we should just take it right out of the budget. Well, I'd have Principal Jocelyn <laughs> talk to you about that. I mean, I think certainly... Well, he can talk to me all he wants, but yeah. if he's going to leave a position in a budget and have a funding source attached to it that ultimately he can't fill and we're just taking that money to transfer it to another line item that now is in a, a deficit, then we have to decide whether or not we really need that position. Well, I think it's a difference, uh, it's a difference between need and, and recruiting. So uh, he would tell you that he has not found... Um, an individual who possesses the skills and knowledge to be a literacy coach. Mm -hmm. um, I think he would say that doesn't mean he wouldn't be successful in that endeavor next school year, but you're right. I mean, if we haven't found a literacy coach by this juncture, we're not going, in right. reality, we're not going to. But that, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to next year. I mean, that's, that's a conversation, certainly. Well, and, and I'll certainly have that. I, I just... I'm hearing the administration say that in, in lieu of another area of the budget that needs funding, we're okay with leaving these vacant. And I'm hearing a rationale for that is that given the time of year, we're not going to find someone suitable for, suitable for that position. The question becomes, if we can survive from now until the end of the year without that person providing that service, then it begs the question, do we in fact need it? 
and it, it may be a recruitment issue, but at some point we have to decide if we need it that badly, then we need to find someone to fill that position. Mm -hmm. We can't continue to leave these positions vacant for an entire school year. And we're okay with not filling a math interventionist position at the Henry Lord Community School? <clears throat> Wasn't that just a position that the committee just got on record within the last budget to add? Again, the principal has not been able to identify an individual who has the skill set to be a math interventionist. We certainly would like, Mr. Costa, all these positions to be filled because the principals came before the finance subcommittee and you know submitted their budgets to the committee of the whole saying that in, they feel these positions are necessary to continue the progress within their schools. Um, so I, I know that each of the principals would love to have these positions filled. They just have not been able to um, recommend uh, a candidate for an, uh, for appointment that that you know that they feel is uh, has the qualifications um, for their schools. Again, my comments to that would be just like the previous comments I made. If if they felt it was going to make that much of an impact in their school, that they came and requested it, and we funded it, and now they haven't been able to find somebody that fits the role that they need for that position. We're going to leave that position vacant, and they're going to get by with that with that person anyway. Right, and I, I think that the um, getting by, I mean, they would like to be able to provide those services to students. I know Principal Curley would very much like to have a math interventionist in place delivering direct math support to students each and every day. I know she's been... Um, those positions are posted. She's been um, interviewing and, again, just hasn't found a candidate that she feels strongly about. So I would say the principals want and need these positions because, quite frankly, we have, um, we have students at Henry Lord who are not getting that second and third dose of math instruction as they need because, because that position is not filled. No further questions. I yield. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I think this is the beginning of a lot of tough choices that this committee is going to be making for this year and for next year. Um, I agree with Mr. Martins that if you don't have the money for a new car, you have to buy a used car. And um, I agree with Mr. Costa to some degree about some of the positions, although I, I don't necessarily cast judgment about those specific positions because they haven't been able to be filled because I believe we're getting by without them, but I don't think that's where we necessarily want to be. But I think this committee um, over the next six months is gonna be picking positions that we may have to get by on because as I look at some of the cost-saving measures that are getting us through the end of this year, it doesn't put us in an optimal position for next year, let's face it. And not only that, obviously we're going to have to increase what we budget for health insurance for next year after what happened this year. And we're putting ourselves in a position where we have less money, circuit breaker money, et cetera. So none of this is enviable. None of this is easy. There's going to be a lot of tough choices. Um, you know, if, if the city can continue only to meet the minimum required by law and even at that not do it, um, you know, at one time, this committee needs to get used to making tough choices um, and not being able to fill positions and um, making people upset uh, if, we're, if we're going to stay within the budget. So this is the beginning of a lot of tough choices, I believe, for this committee. Um, that being said, um, as far as your recommendations, I mean, they're not, you know, what you come here to want to do, obviously, but I, I agree with your recommendations. I certainly one of the last things I would want to do is take away the extended learning time at schools. But again, everything is on the table as far as next year goes. Um, but for this year, I think your recommendations will get us through the end of the year. And with that, I yield. <clears throat> Mr. Maynard. Yeah, uh, Mr. Superintendent, uh, freezing uh, books, textbooks account, will that interfere with any student trying to learn uh, that needs a textbook? Uh, Mr. Maynard, I think as, as Dr. Roy um, laid it out for us, it, that $200,000 would have gone to expand a current um, pre-engineering program both at the elementary schools and at the middle schools. So she's saying that she can, you know, not move forward with that this year. So in other words, it's not going to compromise any of our students in terms of not having 
um, the current textbooks that they need. This would be an expansion of the program that she's saying um, we would hold off uh, until next year to do. Okay, I am. Uh, Mr. Andrade. Just a, a quick question, uh, Mr. Almeida. Uh, if I read the uh, figures correctly, are you still, uh, even with these uh, proposals, short by about $250,000? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, and and as, but you plan to monitor it before you make any any uh, uh, any, any further uh, recommendations. The, the hope, Mr. Andre, is that the health insurance line comes down a little bit. You know, in previous years we've seen savings in in health insurance. So far, the trends don't appear to be to be going that way. But the hope is that we get something there. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Almeida. These this um, uh, inflation in health care costs. Um, <clears throat> resulting from the retirees. Uh, stating the obvious, this is not something that you anticipated in May and June when you were doing the FY16 budget, correct? No, sir. And it, if I understand this correctly, it's the exact opposite, is it not, of what took place the previous year? We've had, we've had three years, Mayor, Mayor, of good, a really good run. We've right, because when I began my tenure, uh, as chairman of the school committee in January of last year, we were looking at a situation where there had been an overestimation of the health care costs. Approximately 24 million was projected, and it was um, at least a million dollars less than that, if not um, more than, if not even less than a million. Let me say that again. So it was 24 million. So the projection was it was only going to be about 23 million. It might even be 22 million plus, correct? Yes, sir. So this year it's turned out to be the exact opposite of that over the last five months. Is there any underlying rhyme or reason for that, or is this something that shifts every single year depending upon the health care costs of the retirees? Well, it's due to the fact it's it's due to, due to self insurance, and in any given year, right. in any given year, the claims could be high, and this is a year where we exp experience high cl higher claims, premiums have gone up, which we budgeted for, uh, but in addition, we've had an increase in prescription plans, we've had an increase in you know cancer cancer treatments, and that and that type of that type of thing that's really increased the claim cost. Because of the disruption that it causes, is there well, I, I, about three questions. So, is your view that this is something that's faced by all school districts in Massachusetts? I, this um, volatility from year to year in the health insurance cost estimation business. I would. Uh, I, I'd address that only. Be, I mean, we've sure. been very Please much do, yeah. paying attention to the <clears throat> Foundation Review Commission report that said that states very clearly that in both the areas of special education costs and health care costs chapter 70 has not kept pace with the rising costs of each of those areas so the cities and, and towns are going to continue to um, pay more for both of these areas and chapter 70 is not backfilling or providing the necessary resources for those rising costs because it's not keeping pace with the increases in both special education and health care. So I think it's not unique to Fall River. Cities and towns are finding themselves having to take out of the operating budget and, and certainly out of regular education services in many cases to compensate for these two areas that the state ought to be um, funding at a greater level. But that's something I understand. If it was going up every single year, it would be mm -hmm. consistent with other things that I see over the last year in municipal government. For example, the um, oh, uh, 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 pension costs, because people are living longer. But what we're talking about here, Madam Superintendent, I think, still not an expert here, I think is a volatility, because you had the opposite of that in FY15, which of course would be counterintuitive. That would be antithetical to what you just said. Right. How do you explain that? No, well, what we're seeing is a three-year trend of, of an overestimation on the city's part in terms of, of health care. That's what's it. So it's, I don't see it as a year-to-year -year swing. We had a trend, but now it's really the retirees. I and I think as you see more and more retirees and, you know, sort of longer lifespans, right. right, you're going to continue to see. But I don't think that changes the fact that chapter, I mean, the bottom line is also chapter 70 is not keeping right. pace with this. Right. 
um, and there needs to be ongoing advocacy from cities and towns and superintendents and school committees to s around that Chapter 70 formula to keep pace so that you're not taking from one area to compensate right. for another. So, so, so what we saw in FY15, as opposed to being an example of volatility or, an, or something that was um, an anomaly, something that was completely different, was that in view of the rising health care costs of the retirees, we simply, and I wasn't part of it, overestimated what it was going to be in FY15. Correct. And, okay. and 14 and 13. Correct. And, and, and Mayor, if you don't mind me adding, um, plans were renegotiated in the last few years. S say that one more time. Uh, the plans were renegotiated right. in the last right. few years. So right. that, that was a reason we saw the cost come down as well. Right. Now, the FY15 figure, the final figure, resulting from uh, that, that, that be, that the, the issue beginning with the overestimation, and, uh, and now we're at the um, uh, finish line with trying to resolve it, at least before uh, January 4th. Um, you uh, and the superintendent, I, I understand, have, um, uh, and I, I think in, with some um, input from, uh, from the chief of staff, uh, have um, have settled on a number for that amount that is owed, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, that's going to be approximately 1.3 Correct. Plus. Correct. Okay. Short of 1.4, but a little bit over 1.3. Correct. And that's figured into this assessment here that I'm looking at um, that begins de date December 10th, 2015, dear school committee members. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, well, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, you know, indicating here that the um, increased amount of net school spending by 300000 mm -hmm. That's in the, the 300000 is in addition to what was already. That's correct, Mr. Martins. Yeah. So now you're up to about $1.6 No, it's, no, it's 1.3. 1. 1. The, the mayor had made a commitment that we would see another million dollars before the close of the fiscal year to make us whole at 100%. Based on the end of year report, it's no longer $1 million, it's $1.3 million to, in order for us to be at 100% of net school spending. I, I actually think my commitment was even more expansive than that, Madam Superintendent. I think my commitment was whatever is owed, we will pay. Correct. So. Uh, the projection initially was a million, and I kind of remember it went up to a million two. It was, it was that this this was something that I remember hearing could not be definitively resolved until the fall, correct? Uh, September 30th to November, well, let's say third <laughs> or tenth or whatever it was. And, and but now um, that is moving towards definitive resolution, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. So that's FY. 15. And now FY16, in your view, the city has met its commitment for 16, unless you consider the um, uh, underpayment for 15 to be part of 16. Correct. Correct. Okay. All right. That's good. I yield. Anyone else? M Ms. Pants. Uh, just quick, although I don't know if this can be quick, but part of the volatility has to do with the fact that we're in this, the city's in this self-insured type of plan. Yes. I know a couple of years ago we talked about moving over to the GIC, but they wanted to take the two payments for the whole city out of the schools and we wouldn't let that happen. Right. But, but we could plan better if the city moved to a, a different plan, right? Yes. But we're sort of at the city's, we don't really have control over that. You're right. Right? Yes. I'm just, you know, because I, 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 you know, this like down two million one year, up two million one year is not really working for me. So I think we need to have conversations going forward about the health insurance with the city. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Martin. Uh, I move that this item be tabled uh, until the uh, administration can come up with a more definitive reasons as to why they want to take it from the ver various accounts and the impact that that has on uh, other issues within the budget. Which, which administration? The school administration? School administration. Okay. So you're moving that it be tabled? I think we just discussed that. No seconds? I, 
I, I, uh, yes, Mr. Andrews. I, I really don't think that uh, that we're going to find anything anything better to take take the money out of uh, these. Uh, these are some of these choices are not good choices, uh, but uh, but we have to plug this gap uh, uh, as soon as possible. I, I really don't expect that uh, that we're going to find uh, anything any better. Uh, so I I could not support this uh, this motion. So, there being no second. Uh, have we concluded our discussion of this, of item number five? Yes? Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, no, Mr. Almeida. We need to vote. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It just says discuss. So, Chair, can I, uh, I'd like to make a motion um, that the committee direct the CFO to provide a monthly update on the actual and health care costs uh, so that That's we can idea. monitor month to month any. Uh, sure shortfalls going forward. This is something that we got to keep a close eye on and I think monthly reports by the CFO indicating to the committee what our actuals are in cost um, would be helpful to making uh, more informed awesome. decisions on how to close that as we go along as opposed to waiting uh, quarterly for an update and finding out that we've run out of resources to transfer. I'll uh, second that. So. I think that's an excellent idea. Any discussion on that? So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion to approve the recommended spending plan to address the shortfall in health care as Second. it exists now. Second, Mr. Maynard? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Does, thank you, Mr. Almeida. Item six, the November budget report. Oh, Mr. Martins, yes. In uh, the report here, uh, under the line 53-2000 tuition, right, last year we expended 8 million, 8.3 million, and this year's uh, original appropriation is 4.1 million. Wait a minute, if you expended eight million yep. and you budgeted four million, isn't there something wrong here? Last year in total, if you if you include circuit breaker, we spent nine million. Okay. Last year the school committee approved a, um, a prepayment of a million dollars that we made last year. So if you take the nine million, subtract the million, it's about eight million dollars. Uh, so for this year, we're projecting currently 8.6 million in tuitions. Okay, but this, when I look at this budget, it doesn't tell me. You know, I look at this and say, wait a minute, the budget for, for tuition is four million. It's not. It's cost a lot more than four million dollars. Once again, where does the money come from is immaterial. How much does that line item cost? Mr. Martins, we provide the, a revolving report to you on a quarterly basis, and you can see that on a quarterly basis how much the tuition is within oh. the circuit breaker account. Yeah, you, you know, the circuit breaker coming in, and, uh, and that's, if you, that's an anticipated revenue. I, I, it's, it's anticipated based on the prior year's expenses. I'm sorry? It's anticipated based on prior year's expenses, yes. Correct, absolutely so. You're basically one year in your arrears. Uh, I understand that, but indeed, I, it just seems of misunderstanding here, at least on my part, in that the, when I look at this, it's $4 million. Okay, that's, that's the budget for uh, you know, tuition. It's not. It's that plus the uh, circuit breaker. Well, why isn't that indicated in some fashion? that says, hey, the budget is $8 million and we anticipate getting $4 million from uh, uh, Circuit Breaker. Now, Circuit Breaker is, the, uh, the expenditure of that money is up to the school district or up to the city, actually. Is that not so? It's, it's, a, it's monies that we receive that we deposit into our revolving fund. To the school department account? Yes. Okay. It could be used for anything. We use it for tuitions, which is an, the right. allowable Now, we're using it for tuition. Yep. 
But if someone could come along and say, hey, well, no, we're going to use it for something else. Right? The, now, the state recommends that you use it for tuitions, Mr. Martins. Yes, it recommends it. Um, is this has this always been like that, or is this the first time that I'm seeing it? Has what always been that way? Like the on the two on the the budget report yep. of uh, tuition of four million dollars when it's really around eight or nine between eight and nine million dollars. It's, it's usually six million dollars, Mr. Martins. I'm sorry. It's usually six million dollars. The budget. Six million. Yes. But last year we expended eight million. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. a good. So two, six, two six, million dollar difference. I mean, what well, the heck? Six, amongst six plus, friend, no problem. Six plus two. That's eight million dollars. Uh, two out of the revolving account. Boy, sometimes when I look at this budget, it's hard to determine. You know, I'm sitting at my desk at home and I'm looking at this. And I say, where the devil is this coming from? I uh, in the the budget for. Tuition is not four million dollars. It's four million dollars plus a whole heck of a lot more. Where that whole heck of a lot more comes from, okay? Uh, it's the circuit breaker funds. The circuit breaker funds. I don't know how much it's going to be. You do. I don't. And I'm sitting here saying, well, we need to approve this stuff. Thank you. I you. Mr. Vice Chairman, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Almeida, if you put the total amount of sped monies that were needed in our budget, when that reimbursement for expenses we've paid on those tuitions comes in, we'd ultimately have to transfer that money out. Correct. So you've chosen to just take the average amount of reimbursement we get and reduce that budgeted amount by that so that we're not carrying money in a line item that we don't need. For well, that particular line. That's what was done, and it took into account the million dollars that was prepaid in the previous year. Right. Yep. So, and I understand Mr. Martin's point regarding it can be used somewhere else, but then that would just leave us a deficit in our special ed tuition line if someone decided to take that money and use it elsewhere. Yes. So it's understood that because it was used to pay tuition for special ed in a previous year, that it would be used back in that line to continue to pay for it going forward. Correct. Okay. I, 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 just, I, I just wanted to make sure that, that I was on the same page because that's the way I always understood it, that technically you could put the $8 million that's needed in that line. You but could. when your reimbursement comes in from the previous year's expenses, you'd have to either put it in that line, which would eventually need to be transferred out, or you'd have to take that money and put it somewhere else in the budget that doesn't have the money that was needed. Well, and you would increase the total budget by $2 million as well. Or, or increase the bottom line. Correct. Right. Okay. I noticed the student transportation line is highlighted, and it says that it's being reviewed because it represents the total contracted exposure, not actual spending. Um, have we had to add any additional bus routes to what we initially had budgeted for? Because this one seems pretty cut and dry to me. We know what our contracts say. We know how much they're going to cost. And so we budget for those. So we should be on par for paying those and remaining, um, having enough money in those lines to, to pay those contracts. Have we had to add additional routes? And, and is that why it's being reviewed? I know, I know of um, one bus that we've had to add. I know of another bus where we consolidated two routes that use vans at a rate per day to a bus, that one should have been just about cost neutral. So there may be a shifting in some, uh, some routes. I know that we've added at least one bus. Typically at this point in the year, once we get through the first three months of the year, we're doing a cleanup of any, any of the buses and on almost on a monthly basis, Ms. Cabral and her assistant uh, do a consolidation and we try to reuse those, those vans as, as uh, expeditiously as possible to try to consolidate those costs. Mm -hmm. When we budget at the beginning of the year and execute the contracts, they're all executed based on a if we use this many vehicles for this many days, the cost runs out, and that includes the vans. Mm -hmm. So cur currently, when we set up those contracts, they go right out to the 8.2. So that's what we mean when we say it's based on the contracted exposure, not the actual uh, you know, cost that's being consumed. And that's fine. And the only thing that would change our exposure would be if there were buses added. 
Correct. But I we don't know what our contracts cost, and we have budgeted for how much they cost. So the only increase would be if you had to add additional route. Correct. But at the same time, there's no way to account for reducing. We contract, if I say right. I need 10, 10 vans from you right. for 180 days, it's going to cost X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. If I'm only using six a day, I don't have a way to reduce the contract, right. so it comes in as an overage at this point in the year. We'll do a cleanup and get you an actual you know, expended year to date that, that reflects that number a little closer. If we could keep that number coming as well? Absolutely. And I don't mind, I mean, my personal preference was, would be to highlight it like it is now so that it remains an area of focus. Um, Sped tuitions and tuition and health care. Those are the three that typically get us in a situation where we're scrambling to transfer monies in and out of different accounts to cover. So we already addressed health care, the transportation. Once you get it cleaned up, if you can provide us with um, an update on that, I think that will help month to month as we go forward from now until the end of the fiscal year. Absolutely. So if you don't mind, that would be great. If I can ask that through the chair, I'm not sure necessarily a vote is needed. It's just a matter of how it will be presented in future budget uh, presentations. With that, I yield. Any further discussion on this? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Next is the um, end of year report and net school spending. Once again, Mr. Almeida. Good evening. So what I provided you is the, uh, the two-column sheet that we give you typically on a uh, quarterly basis. And um, as of this time, you can see that in FY15, the, uh, the shortfall was, was about $2.2 million, but that was caused by a million dollars in prepaid. So if you take the million dollars in prepaid, it's about $1.2 million, which is roughly the figure we're talking about here. Um, so in FY15, we, we were at 98.3% of net school spending. Now, if you go to FY16, uh, this is the year where the city, we have put the health insurance within our budget, so you'll see a big drop off in the city side of the ledger here in costs. Um, uh, net school spending for this year was 130 million 963260. If you take the uh, the carryover of the 2.2 million that's there, it brings it to 133 million 168717 for this year. This year's spending plan, as it stands, with the 1.6 million that the city transferred to us um, in September, uh, brings us to 131 million 840470 which leaves us the shortfall that we're talking about of a million three twenty eight two forty seven and that would leave us at ninety nine percent where we currently stand so we're kind of covering the same ground we did about ten minutes ago before we talked about the November budget report, but the one point three plus is what is owed because of the overestimation of health insurance costs in f y fifteen Yes, sir. Carries over into FY16. Exactly. At, at the risk of asking a question that um, I, I, I should know the answer to, but why does that only bring us to 99% instead of 100%? Because you have to take in the carryover from the previous year. When, when you're short in one year, that, that shortage that you have carries over into the following year, in this case, 2016. Right, but so once, that's, once that's met, once that 1.3 is met, sometime between now and June 30th, then we're at 100%, correct? Exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's where we are now. Right. Yeah. So I'm giving you, I, I'm just providing the update as of today. I see. All right. So in, just to, for clarification, because you and I keep having this conversation sure. as well, <laughs> you're not the only one. Oh, that's good to know. So it's 99%, and once that 1.3 yeah, is made to the committee, be we, will be, we will be at 100%. We will be at 100%, okay. exactly. And once that payment is made, then we would have been at 100% for FY15 and FY16. Yes. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's the answer I wanted, Mr. Almeida. Thank that, you very much. That's the answer. That's very good. <laughs> Mr. Martins. I'm going to ask the same question again. That 1.3 million, uh, does that include the 300,000 
Elliot. Yes, it does, Mr. Mr. It Marks. Does. It does. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Just for the um, committee's information, we are expecting a letter from the commissioner to the mayor and uh, myself indicating the specific amount of the shortfall. Typically, we get that letter by now, but uh, because we filed the end of the year report October 31st rather than October 1st, um, I, I presume that that letter is held up a little bit by that, but we, sh we should be receiving that soon, which certifies, if you will, um, the shortfall that needs to be okay. mm -hmm. made up. All right. Um, there being no further questions or comments, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Almeida. Thank you. <clears throat> Item number eight, progress of the committee addressing its goals is presented by Mr. Andrade. I did over the weekend take a look at the uh, October meeting where uh, Mike Goodman made, made the presentation to the committee on the, um, uh, the survey that was done of uh, uh, staff of the Florida school system. Uh, there were two uh, items that uh, that appeared to be somewhat problematic, or or should, appeared to be items that the, the committee should be uh, working on. Uh, one of them was uh, an outreach issue. Uh, when we consider the the small amount of um, of uh, respondents to the survey, uh, so we would have to uh, to come up with some opportunity to to try to engage more and more people, uh, not only in the uh, uh, staff of the schools, but to also uh, in the community. Uh, the other issue came in the, the last section of the, of the survey, the last major question that, that was dealt with. And uh, it uh, seemed to show that uh, in terms of uh, people's trust of, uh, of, of the committee, it was running at 50-50 uh, uh, or less. Uh, so there, there was a, a somewhat of a problem in that area. Um, I spoke to uh, both uh, Mike Goodman and, uh, and uh, Tom Kelly, who had uh, helped us with the uh, AIP um, some time ago, and uh, I ran a couple of things by, by them. Uh, there were two items that uh, it seems that we, we, can, uh, we can try to do in order to uh, both help with the, the outreach, uh, gain some so, some more engagement on the part of the uh, the, the public, and secondly, uh, try to improve uh, on, on the trust issue. Um, w one of them would be, and this this is uh, just uh, my suggestion, I, uh, and I, I think that uh, I would want to run it by the uh, the evaluation subcommittee uh, starting in the in the new um, uh, the new year. Uh, that would be a um, uh, a re-examination of the public input um, uh, policy. Uh, we have been following a, a, a fairly restrictive policy for some time now, dating back to the time that that uh, uh, Judge Armand uh, um, Fernandes, Fernandes uh, had had uh, dealt with the with the committee when we were still um, on uh, the state watch. Uh, and uh, while it's made the uh, meetings a lot more, um, uh, uh, has, has expedited the meetings, we haven't had lo long periods of time uh, for public input, there, there's been a problem in that uh, people don't feel that, uh, that uh, they, uh, they can address the, the committee very, very easily because, they, because it's so restrictive. They are restricted only to, to items that are on the agenda. So, uh, I. Uh, I think that uh, that we have to uh, take a look at this uh, once again, and I, I have a feeling that uh, there is some support on the committee uh, to uh, re-examine this. Uh, I've at least heard one one person in indicate that uh, here. So uh, so that would be uh, one item that uh, we might, might want to take a look at. A second item that uh, uh, would be um, might be worthwhile uh, doing would be uh, to try to have a. Um, uh, a couple of sessions of, let's call it, meet the school committee, uh, opportunities for not only uh, staff of the schools, but also, also the, uh, the public in general, uh, to meet with members of the committee on an informal basis uh, where perhaps they, they would be able to uh, uh, 
to, to uh, give us some input as to uh, what they feel about uh, what's happening in, in, the, in the public schools. And this actually was uh, an outgrowth of, um, of, uh, of a, a thought that uh, Dr. Ed Costa had, had mentioned some, some, some time ago. Uh, now, the danger in that, of course, is that we could come to uh, wherever, wherever the, this uh, meeting could be and we could be, spend an hour and a half staring at four walls as we have as, as a little more participation or less than we had in a, in a survey, uh, but it's probably worth a shot. Uh, I'm not looking for any, um, a, any vote or, uh, on, on this um, uh, today. I, I think I would like to, uh, to run by, that by uh, the, uh, the subcommittee and perhaps put uh, some more um, uh, details in, into, the, uh, into the plans and then come back to the, uh, the, the full committee. Thank you very much. Any comment, any discussion? Thank you, Mr. Andrade. <clears throat> Next, uh, once again, uh, Mr. Andrade, House Bill 340, High Stakes Testing Moratorium. Uh, House 340 uh, is, uh, is an act that was uh, uh, sponsored by Representative Marjorie Decker of Cambridge. Uh, it, it has been referred to the Joint Committee on Education, uh, and it, is, uh, it recommends a uh, uh, a three-year moratorium on high-stakes testing. Now, uh, I was going to try to uh, do a, a synopsis of this uh, for the committee so that uh, uh, we could synthesize. Uh, this, is, this is several pages uh, long, as the uh, uh, most uh, bills are, but uh, I figured I could keep it uh, uh, relatively uh, concise uh, in terms of going over this for, for the committee. I was going to do this this afternoon, but of course uh, we had uh, our grandson home and he had other plans. So I, I actually did this a, a couple of minutes before we started the meeting. So uh, just bear with me. Um, the, uh, the bill essentially uh, states that uh, the uh, testing would not be a condition of graduation uh, during the three year period. It could not be used to evaluate educators. Uh, park would be forbidden for, uh, for three years. The pub public schools or school districts were not to be evaluated based on results of, of standardized testing. There was a task force to be formed and they, they were, it was specified as to uh, who would constitute this, uh, this task force. It's a, a cast of thousands, it appears, uh, but they do specify uh, the individuals that uh, are, are the positions that would be a part of, of this uh, task force. Um, the task force would be formed to review the use of standardized tests to determine whether uh, the standardized tests do advance the goals of the Education Reform Act of 1993. Um, it would also examine the impact uh, of the standardized testing on teaching and learning, the availability of mechanisms other than the testing uh, to, to, uh, to assess the students and, and, and schools. It would assess the, the uh, technology that, that would be uh, uh, needed for the testing and, of course, the, the cost. And uh, in a nutshell, that, that's uh, essentially the, uh, uh, the House 340. What I was looking to do was to, to uh, get a, a vote from the committee uh, to, uh, uh, in support of uh, House 340 to send, uh, to send the, the result of, the, of this uh, vote, assuming that uh, it, is, uh, uh, it, it does support uh, the, the bill, to uh, not only our local delegation, but also to the, the uh, chairs of the uh, Joint <coughs> Committee on, on Education. Um, the, uh, some of the rationale for, uh, for the distrust of, uh, of testing was presented by, uh, by Dr. Costa earlier in uh, the, uh, the uh, public input. Uh, so um, I would like to make a motion to, uh, to go on record as uh, supporting House 340. Second. Mr. Vice Chairman. I just <clears throat> and I want to thank Mr. Martin, uh, excuse me, Mr. Andrade for um, providing us with the actual language uh, in the bill. The question I have is, is that in, either to him or 
the superintendent or anybody uh, who may have information on it, but does this forbid school, would this forbid our school district from using any of the current benchmarks that we use? Um, so this is, this would be exclusively to the MCAS as we know it now. I don't believe it, it would. It's not. It's not clear. I, I didn't see any in language to that effect. Uh, but what it, what it says is that uh, that students will not uh, will will not uh, fail to graduate because of their scores on, on the MCAS test, and that um, uh, neither, neither teachers nor uh, uh, nor schools will be, will be uh, right. And I'm okay with all of that. I, I, my concern is that if if the committee goes on record to in support of this, and, and it does pass, um, does that forbid districts from using um, the local benchmarks that we use? Is that considered under this bill as part of standardized testing, uh, the DIVLs and other benchmarks that are used to monitor our district's pro progress? Would this bill I, I don't believe that that's the intent because Chapter 69 basically talks about a state assessment system, so, right, so the legislature would have to modify the statute around the state assessment system. I would just, just for the committee's um, deliberation, in your binders was um, a, a sort of a short version of the Every Child Achieves Act of 2015 that Congress has just passed. Mm -hmm. And if you take a look at um, the federal law that's that's been passed, um, the second paragraph uh, there, and I'll just read the first sentence. The bill maintains the federally required two tests in reading and math per child per year in grades three through eight and once in high school, as well as a science, as science tests given three times between grades three and 12. So here you have the federal law imposing that. And really the, the teeth behind the federal law, as, as I understand it, is the funding. So if, so if you're not going to follow the federal law, just to be simplistic about it, they, have, they, will, um, they could potentially withhold Title I funding, which for our district is six million, Title II funding, which is over a million, Title III. So that's kind of how, right, they, they sort of get um, uh, compliance to the law because it comes with uh, millions of dollars. So I just point that out that Congress has just passed it, passed more testing or current, you know, sort of consistent testing while there's, um, you know, certainly a bill in, in, at the State House that would put, create a moratorium on that. I don't know how those two sort of, you know, interact. I, I, I agree that uh, there seems to be a potential conflict. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that they, they are aware of that uh, at, at the State House, just as, uh, as we are. And actually, this, this, um, uh, this federal law just, just recently passed, I believe it was within the last mm -hmm. week or so. Uh, the, uh, uh, but I, I would imagine, I believe that they have to present a plan, the, the state would have to present a plan to the federal government, which, which the federal government would have to approve. And uh, uh, here in, the, in this particular uh, bill, it does not say that you do not test. It simply takes away some of the punitive or, or uh, pejorative uh, uh, effects of, of the testing. And, and the superintendent is, is correct. If the, if the, if the, if the feds interpret it uh, one, uh, one way, they can certainly uh, uh, scuttle that. But I, I, uh, if this bill were, were to pass, I would, uh, I would trust the state to be able to work that, uh, things mm -hmm. out with the, uh, uh, with the federal government. So it remo this, the House bill removes all um, accountability measures, no leveling of schools, no percentiles, none of that, um, the measures that, that we have imposed on us, if you will, at this point. All that would, that, that, all those accountability seems. systems would go, um, I guess, for three years, as I understand now, this. Now, I, I forgot to mention one thing also. There were a couple of other uh, pages that uh, I included after the, the House bill. Uh, one of them, was a, uh, some information on a, um, an accountability measure that, or, or, or a, a, uh, a high school requir a graduation requirement that Rhode Island has, which is a, mm -hmm. a senior uh, project. Uh, and um, I know that Rhode Island has often uh, been below Massachusetts in terms of, uh, of uh, 
educationally. Uh, however, this, this seemed like a, a very good idea that has come out of Rhode Island where the, the, uh, in order to graduate, one of, the, one of the graduation requirements would be to work on this project which would try to tie in what the student had learned in school with something practical, most likely career oriented on the outside. So it gives the, the student the opportunity to, uh, to actually um, apply some of, the, some of the items that he'd learned in school in, in the real world. Uh, the other article was about a, a, uh, multiple assessments which I really think is, is the direction we should be going into uh, as opposed to just a, a simple test. Uh, and uh, they talk about uh, exactly how you might be able to weight this, where, <coughs> where let's say school grades would be worth X number of points, the, uh, the test worth X, uh, another uh, quantity of points, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and really, it, I think it would be, uh, that would be, if, if that is what this, uh, the, the state ended up doing, I think it would be a fairer, uh, more comprehensive assessment, and uh, it would be an assessment that would probably provide uh, somewhat less angst for every, everyone involved. Would, would there be any uniform standard statewide to replace what we now have with the test, the MCAS test or the PARC test? Would there to, be to, to replace? Yeah. I, I would assume that there would be something. And, but, and but, I, the but, testing is going to be with us regardless. What's, the, when, what's that? The testing is going to be with us regardless. The question is how, how important uh, is it going to be to the total, total assessment? If it is simply the test, which it is right now, uh, that, that, that's one item as, oppo uh, as opposed to having multiple assessments where, uh, where someone would not be totally judged based on one test. But I thought that the bill proposed a moratorium on any testing. Uh, on on the, the high stakes nature, not, not the testing per se. You, you can do the testing. And, and how do you define that, high stakes? Uh, that would be the accountability measures. Right. And, and so, I, I mean, it's almost like we're going around in circles. And, and it, is there anything proposed to take the place of what we now have on the issue of accountability? No, because that, that's why you have a task force that, it, that is supposed to study that. A what? A task, task force, force. that, that is, uh, is put together to study that. Um, Ms. Cusick, would you like to speak about this? I really wasn't prepared to speak about this tonight. I didn't notice it was on the agenda, I'll confess, but um, the bill is being supported by the MTA and the moratorium is not on testing. It's on the high stakes that are associated with testing for the purpose of, as Mr. Andrade explained, studying the impact of that testing and talking about what could be put in place of a single assessment for making high stakes decisions about schools and about students. That's the purpose and if you would like, I do have a lot of information, I don't have it with me, that I could, I'm happy to bring with me to present in January if you wanted to even talk more about it at that point. Well, I won't be here, but I think it warrants it. <laughs> okay. I just want to offer a little clarification. It might be in the audience. You never know. <laughs> okay. Okay. That would be great. I think you should. Thank you. I support that. Um, any, Ms. Pansley? Right. So, um, at this point, I, I can't support the bill. Um, I do support a lot of what's in it as far as putting the task force together. <clears throat> I really support bringing other measures in when um, evaluating, like they talked about points for volunteerism, extracurricular activities, GPA. I guess what I don't understand is why this can't be done at the same time and why, why the high stakes testing needs to be stopped while the task force convenes. Because I don't like stopping something for three years when there's no plan in place. I think the plan needs to change. I think things need to change. But I don't like the thought of doing that without any plan. I don't understand why the task force hadn't been meeting for the last three years. We've all been talking about this for how long and then have a plan to go into place right now. So that's my issue with this. Almost everything in it I agree with, but I don't know how you know, um, parents understand whether the, the, the school that their child is going to is performing the way it's supposed to be performing. I mean, how many conversations have we had over the last three or four months related to data when, we, you know, not to get into, but when we talk about the superintendent's contract or other things, I mean, we talk about data. That's, that's what we talk about. And I don't know where that leaves us if we just drop that over three years parents knowing how their children are doing, how the schools are doing, um, principals knowing better how teachers are doing. And I also wonder about 
a child or a student like the two students we have that can only graduate if they pass the test, then for three years that's not the case, and then and then it goes back to it or it doesn't. I, I just think there should be a plan in place. So I don't support um, I don't support this right now. But but I think that's what. Ms. Cusick wants to address in January. She wants to address that very If we table point. it, I'm open to it, but if I, we vote I, on tonight, I'm not. I would support that, because I, I, I'd prefer not to vote on something that I just don't know nearly enough about. I, 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 I mean, I do know. I mean, um, I didn't just show up tonight right, not knowing. Right. I do no, know. I'm, what I'm I, sure you're opinion. more knowledgeable than I am on it, but <laughs> nevertheless, Mr. Hart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would maybe just go, I was going to say exactly what you just said and maybe just table it till January, right. and then they can... Uh, Ms. Cusick uh, can bring the information, and uh, you can have a very thorough, knowledgeable discussion on it. If I support motion that. To, motion to table. Second. On the second. Oh, I'm sorry. That's so we have, a, we have a, I'll make <laughs> it easy for you. For, for the sec second yeah. month, I will, I will withdraw the motion, uh, and um, uh, we, we, we can, uh, we can, what's that? Just let it be tabled. Oh. Same thing. It'll come up next okay. month. Okay. Did, who offered the, ta uh, the table? Was Mr. Hart moved okay. to table. Right. Mr. Maynard seconded it. On a motion, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Mr. Roll Mr. call, Chair. please. This is on whose motion? On a motion to table. To table. No okay. discussion on a motion to table. Mr. Andrews? Yes. Mr. Cotton? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. yes. Mr. Maynard? Yes. Mrs. Pantley? Yes. 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 Can, I don't know if this is good, but can I ask that the information be put in the binders so we can look at it before the meeting? Okay, thank you. Item 10, the creation of an ad hoc committee for the purposes of, purposes of screening candidate applications for the administrative assistant to the school committee Motion position. Second with a question. Excuse me? Second with a question, second with a question Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've yes. seconded Mr. Hart's motion. I just have a question. Yes, good question. The need for the ad hoc, Madam Superintendent, is that essential um, to be done now, or is this something that can be wait until January? My fear is that essentially you're going to have an ad hoc committee that's going to be made up of members who sit here today and not necessarily members who will sit here next month. Um, if, if it's essential to the hiring process, and getting someone screened and interviewed and a decision being made, that's one thing. But if, if it's not of something, that, if it's not an issue of uh, essence and it can wait, then um, I'll defer to, the, to my colleagues, but I think it may make sense to wait until January to have um, that committee created to screen an incoming administrative assistant for the school committee. So. I was just going to suggest that there's four of us that will remain, um, that Mrs. Karen's doing two jobs right now, and I'm willing to volunteer to be on the ad hoc committee to expedite the process um, so we can get Mrs. Karen and her job and, and we can find our new assistant as soon as possible. In consultation with legal counsel, the creation of the ad hoc committee would, re would allow for a process um, that could take place in executive session for the screening of the candidates um, so that that, um, that process is confidential, if you will, in terms of the applications. Once that process is beyond the screening and names finalists, then it becomes a more public process. Um, but in conversation, this would be a way to start the process, knowing that it would um, be a number of weeks before finalists are named and the new committee of the whole had an opportunity to interact with that process. Okay, so that won't prohibit, well, that'll prohibit any incoming members from being a part of the ad hoc committee, but not necessarily making a decision on who, in fact, is hired. Correct. Okay, that's fine. I yield. I Mr. Move, Martins. I move that this be tabled. Uh, this is an issue, uh, although there was a motion, but not a motion, another one to, uh, to table this issue uh, to the new school committee uh, and let that body uh, determine as to what it wants to do. Uh, I, for one, uh, want to receive a copy of all of the applicants so that I can review it. I'm not willing to, um, you know, indicate that or select or vote upon 
what someone else thought is, a, is a, uh, an acceptable candidate. I understand, Ms. Martins. We're just trying to do it without violating any open meeting law around this piece of it, which is why it's structured in this manner. It's not to prohibit anyone from seeing all of the candidate applications. Again, it's done in conjunction with um, advice from legal counsel as to what the process could be um, so that committee members can see all the uh, applications. And, you know, the uh, two new members that will be coming on, um, they should have a say in this, uh, in there. And so the motion that I'm making is to table it until the January meeting and have it at that point in time. Of course. Yeah. Second. Anybody? Mr. Andre? Well, uh, why don't we uh, t take a, a, a couple of um, uh, a question. Uh, there was oh, I didn't question realize that. Well, <laughs> if we created the unhoc committee, the soonest that this really would happen in executive session would be January anyway, correct? Correct. We're correct. just expediting it in the process to be ready when the new members come on. If we wait another month, then we're dragging out another month for Mrs. Karen have to do two jobs. Uh, I'm just confused. We're not trying to, to keep new members from having um, being able to be part of the process. Uh, uh, attorney Assad. If, if I could just for a second. The reason for an ad hoc committee, if the committee decided to go that way, was because um, if there is no ad hoc committee and it's the committee of the whole that reviews all the documents, that's not an open session. And the, one of the reasons why the law allows for an ad hoc committee, if the committee so desires, is the fact that many people or some people may object to, to having their name mentioned as a candidate for a position when it's not for the finalist position. And that is the reason why ad hoc committees are allowed under the law and under the statute. But it is the committee's decision as to whether or not they want to go that, that route or go the route of having all of the applications delivered to them and, and to, to delve into it in open session that may or may not impede someone from applying for the position. Um, whether it's done in December or January also is of the committee's decision. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hart. Um, the last time we did this, we didn't have an ad hoc committee. It worked out pretty well. If the, the committee wants to have the ad hoc committee, that's fine. Did the, Mr. Martins get a second? No, not yet. <clears throat> okay, ours has a, sec, a motion and a second. I say we move the vote. Any further discussion on this? No, if there's a second on a motion to table, Mr. Chair, no discussion. Roll call. There was no second. There was no second. Oh, I thought you made a second, Mr. Hart. I made the motion to accept this no, to as accept. is. accept. I yeah. apology. Point of Wait. <clears throat> we have no second on the motion to table. We have a second on the motion to form an ad hoc committee. Yep. Correct, Attorney yes. Assange? Yes. Okay. So Move the question, Mr. Chair. Roll call vote on the motion to form an ad hoc committee. Mr. Andre? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Hart? Yes. Mr. Martin? No. Mr. Maynard? Yes. Mrs. Yes. Mr. Yes. Okay. Item number 11. <clears throat> so I ask that this be put on the agenda for this evening because um, before I depart, I wanted to address this with the school committee and all those who are watching. I think it is. Um, I think it's, it's clear, it's crystal clear that we have uh, statewide, region-wide, even nationwide, an opiate epidemic. Um, the, um, the governor has worked very hard to put together a bill to try to address it. The attorney general has been um, deeply and energetically involved in coming up with her own program. Um, the District Attorneys Association as well. When I um, was departing the District Attorneys Association at the end of 2014, we had received a, um, a grant from the legislature of $500,000 to study best practices uh, throughout the state and even beyond as to the best prevention programs um, or best prevention program um, and uh, with, the, with the view towards implementing uh, 
these, this program uh, in other areas beside the one where it presently existed. So this, this epidemic is um, uh, cutting across all um, social and economic lines. We know that. And uh, I think it is absolutely imperative that we begin a program in our, in our middle schools uh, with, uh, with kids as early as sixth and seventh grade. Uh, if we are going to do something about stemming what seems to be an ever-increasing problem, which strikes right at the heart of everything we want to accomplish in the city, whether it's economic development, uh, educational attainment, healthier neighborhoods, um, obviously more public safety. So I wanted to report to the committee about the um, uh, result of what the district attorneys, uh, and there was a special committee with three of the, of the district attorneys. Uh, I was on it originally, the Berkshire district attorney and the district attorney for the Northwest District, so that would be David Capeless for the Berkshires and David Sullivan for the Northwest. So the program that the DAs identified as the one that they felt had the most promise is one that's been operating very successfully in the Northampton Public Schools. The name of the program is SBIRT, meaning Screening, Brief Intervention, Referral for tr Treatment. Um, and I've had uh, several conversations over the past week with the Berkshire District Attorney David Capeless, and I think this is exactly the kind of program that we should consider, strongly consider, implementing in our Fall River Middle Schools. What differentiates this program from some others is that it doesn't segregate the um, so-called at-risk kids or someone's view of what an at-risk kid is. It's, it, it, it is um, more uh, egalitarian than that. It encompasses everybody. It screens children, sixth and seventh grade, who display early warning signs and the way the program works is as follows. Um, so there are three steps, as I mentioned, screening, brief intervention, referral for treatment. The screening would simply be a supplement to the health screenings, which I understand are already performed annually in schools. When a middle school student uh, is called down to the school nurse for the health screening, he or she would fill out a simple questionnaire before the screenings. Included would be questions such as, have you ever drank alcohol or have you tried smoking? If any red flags go up during the screening, the issue is then taken up by either the school guidance counselor or the nurse who asks the students some further questions. There are no punitive measures taken, which is made clear to the student, but rather the counselor explains the consequences of these actions and asks questions about what motivated the student to try these uh, behaviors. Over three quarters of the, student in, of the students who were surveyed uh, in the Northampton program just demonstrated no warning signs. A majority of those, and a majority of those who did demonstrate warning signs, so that would be the 25%, didn't require any further action beyond school guidance counseling. But for those who demonstrate particularly concerning behavior, they're referred to professional treatment to intervene as soon as possible. As I said before, I think this could be an excellent fit and um, one that is becoming more and more important um, with the opiate crisis that we're facing. I um, would like to arrange for someone who is involved in this program, either from the Northampton School System or the Department of Public Health, to address the school committee, perhaps in February or March, um, so that you would have a more comprehensive view of how this works. But I, I can say this, I know very well the individuals who were involved in the, um, in the study for the District Attorneys Association, um, David Capeless, the Berkshire DA, and David Sullivan, the Northampton DA. They're very serious professionals. And for them to come to the conclusion after I'm sure, after what I am sure was an extensive survey, for them to come to the conclusion that this is a, um, a program that uh, holds tremendous promise and is working, I, I, um, I accredit that very much. So 
That is my uh, proposal, and, um, and I would be happy to, as one of my final acts, uh, arrange for someone to come to address uh, the school committee about this so that this could be considered um, in our Fall River Public Schools for the next uh, school year. Any discussion, any questions? Yes, Ms. Panchley. I, I appreciate you uh, bringing this up. I, I think this, you know, I think everyone has their uh, different things that they bring to the school committee. We're not all former educators, some of us are. And this is just certainly uh, one of your strengths that we'll be missing after um, the school committee meeting. So I appreciate you um, certainly bringing that up tonight. And I would certainly be in favor of listening to um, more about it, what they had to say, more in-depth conversation about it. And uh, I really thank you for bringing that up Great, tonight. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, echo what uh, Ms. Pansley said. I know I've talked to you about this as well, um, but I think by, uh, you know, making your proposal tonight, and uh, I think you made a motion um, to, to have this. Yes. Uh, did you? Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I'm making a motion uh, And I'll, I'll second right. that, uh, but you. on the second, um, I think that's, that, that it's a good idea uh, to do, and, um, you know, obviously I'm not going to be here either next year uh, in January, but... Um, that's something that's near and dear to my heart because I've talked to you about this countless times. So I think that's uh, this is going to be a good, uh, maybe a good first step to do, and hopefully we can mirror that uh, particular program here in the district. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hart. So we have a motion. Any further discussion? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes. And it's an issue of. <clears throat> Point of order, if, if I can ask the indulgence of the committee to take up new business prior to executive session. New business prior to executive session. Okay. I have any any objection to that? No. All right. New I don't know if you wanted to finish the agenda first. I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Um, no. Uh, is there is there new business, Mr. Vice Chair? I have a couple items I'd Great. like to. Would you Thank proceed? you. Yep. <clears throat> um, First thing is, earlier today we talked about, uh, Mr. Andre brought forward the proposal on a moratorium on uh, high stakes, um, not necessarily the testing, but the accountability piece. And um, just recently I came across an article which I read and I sh shared it with the superintendent. Um, you know, I think more and more we're asking of our students um, and our teachers to um, do more. Uh, and, and the pressure is constantly there. Um, so I, I'm going to ask the superintendent, and, and if the committee wants to join me in a vote, we can make it in form of a motion, but I'm going to ask the superintendent to consider um, asking all of her faculty um, and her teachers to suspend any homework or projects uh, during uh, winter break. Um, give that staff, uh, our staff and our students, an opportunity to unwind, decompress, enjoy being uh, young students uh, in our district, um, and also give our educators an opportunity to unwind as well. Um, I think we've come to a point um, here in the state where uh, year after year we continuously are recognized for the good work that we do in our educational system. And um, I believe a superintendent in the uh, South Shore uh, had started this, and, and I, I thought it was interesting, um, but I really, after giving it some thought, um, I know what my uh, three children go through, uh, trying to manage enjoying themselves over winter break and making sure that they're um, getting their projects and their necessary uh, work done. Um, and it sometimes takes away from the fact that um, it's meant for them to have a break, uh, to be young children, go sledding. Uh, I notice and, and I'm hoping that the two student delegates will weigh in on this. Um, and that's why I was asking Mr. Mayor if it could be done prior to executive session because typically they leave um, when we go into executive session. I was hoping to get their input on it as well. But um, I would make that if it's necessary in a form of a motion or unless the superintendent feels uh, there's enough support here to uh, carry that through. I think that could be a, a, a genuine gift uh, to all our faculty and staff to enjoy their time off with uh, their family uh, without uh, having to worry about uh, timelines for projects and uh, homework. And if there are educators, I know the question will be, 
if there are assignments already uh, been issued for that time frame, if we could ask the indulgence of the teachers to put it off the due dates a week um, after coming back uh, to school so to allow for uh, the project to still take place but to give them some additional time to complete it. Um, hopefully this doesn't cause an uproar in the district, but I really feel like um, given the high pressure of, of where we find ourselves in on a day-to-day -day basis, this is a nice uh, way of, a nice gesture of saying enjoy some time with family and friends uh, without having to worry about school and we'll see you in January. With that, I yield. Do we have a second? Mr. Oh, Hart. I'll second it. Oh. On the second? Bah humbug. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know seriousness. No, I think it's, I think it's, a, it's a good idea. Um, I do. I think, uh, it, you know, if, if, if see, how it, see how it works, see how it goes. Um, I, don't, I don't have a, a, you know, a particular problem with it at all. Um, I am interested in what the uh, students say, though. I, I'd like to hear their input. My guess is they're in favor of it, but you know, I could be wrong. You never know. <laughs> Ms. Ms. Fraser. Um, thank you. Yeah, I definitely agree with um, the break that you get, and I think students will come back refreshed and won't feel so like dragged out because they were doing homework over break, so we'll give them time to relax and um, enjoy a break and then come back to school refreshed and ready to learn. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I actually agree. I think it's a great idea. I mean, you know, as you can see, like everyone works really hard, you know, to make sure this is a really good community and everything. And I think that everyone else is going to need a break. And I see what my, you know, my, my fellow classmates go through and everything, and they're really stressed out. And I think this would be perfect for them, you know, like, like a give back to the community. Thank you, Mr. Saffold. Anyone else? Uh, please. Ms. Um, I'm happy to support it, just to drive it home. I think the homework policy, that revision that we made, sort of, I mean, really goes along with this. We sort of have said in our homework policy now that no um, homework can be given over vacation unless there's at least a week prior or a week after to, um, to finish that homework. So I, I think we have that standing policy that we need to, especially us parents that have, uh, you know, children in school need to make sure um, that's being held to. But um, if we want to drive it home a little more with this, <laughs> I'd be happy to um, support the motion. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> How did I know that was going to pass? <laughs> Just two. Yes, Mr. Mr. Uh, Vice Chairman. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd also ask the superintendent, and, and I'm not sure if she's the point person or if Mr. Coogan would be, but I was approached by the president of the North Park uh, Baseball League, who is looking to see if he could um, contact principals to conduct registration um, for the upcoming um, season at the individual schools that encompass the North End where the students would be coming from that play ball. Um, certainly after school hours, um, he was wondering if he could get some consideration to do that, to announce a time uh, where he'll be at a particular school um, in the afternoon um, to do sign-ups. I know they do it at Durfee, they can, they're gonna continue to do that, but they're also looking to increase uh, the number of uh, participants in the summer league to actually be able to go out to the individual schools after school hours to conduct the registration session. So I'm not sure if, if I can, to the superintendent, sure. to Mr. Coogan. Um, and just lastly, I know um, uh, this meeting is, is uh, the last meeting for some of our members and I wanted to take an opportunity to um, not only thank Mr. Maynard, Mr. Hart, and the chairman, Mr. Uh, Mayor Sutter, uh, for their service. Um, some of you uh, have served on this committee for a number of years. Uh, some have served and then came back, uh, in the case of Mr. Maynard. Um, some have served in other elected positions, uh, Mr. Hart, both the council and school committee, and, and Mayor Sutter, obviously, as DA uh, and mayor in, in, in his role here as chair. And I want to thank you, uh, each of you, for your service to the community. Uh, to the district and to uh, the 10,000 students that um, you gave up uh, your time to, to represent. And I want to say thank you to that, uh, to you for that. I also want to point out we have two uh, new members who are here tonight. I want to also take the time to say that uh, welcome aboard um, and uh, be ready to get to work in January. I'm sure we'll have plenty to do. but. Uh, Thank you uh, for the opportunity, and I yield, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, 
Mr. Vice Chairman, Mr. Costa, that was um, greatly appreciated uh, by myself and I'm sure by Mr. Hart and Mr. Maynard as well. I really appreciate that. So, now with respect to your motion about um, the individual from the North Park Little League, do we, did we get a second on that? Because that sounded like a good idea. No, he, he can just, is it Mr. Nato? <clears throat> yes. Okay. He can contact Mr. Coogan directly or Mr. Con Mr. Coogan right. if you give him the, we'll work that out, certainly. Okay. Any other new business? All right. Mayor, um, could we just have the for information um, section placed on file? Motion of to the place agenda. on file. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Was that for the uh, uh, FYI? Yes. The other information? Yes. Um, that went rather quickly. Um, can I bring up a concern? Of course. I, when I look at the, especially on faculty, uh, resignations and as mid-year resignations, um, that certainly throws that classroom into a tizzy. Um, and I'm concerned about this and uh, quite frequently I've asked in the past that we're supposed to get a, an exit survey of the teachers leaving. Uh, and it, I haven't seen one in ages. Uh, and uh, that was voted upon by the school committee to provide that for the uh, resignation of staff. Uh, and as to why they're, you know, why they're leaving. But, uh, I'd like to reaffirm that that still is a requirement of the HR department, and I'd like to have that fulfilled. Mr. Martins, the HR department is um, administering those surveys. It is a topic of discussion with the district capacity project. Um, the human resource department uh, presented at that, uh, at one of our most recent meetings. I'm sure we can get that out to the um, Committee of the Whole for your information. We don't get a lot of um, after the fact, after an individual has resigned in terms of feedback on that survey. I can tell you for the teachers that have resigned uh, that are uh, for, on the for your information section without hopefully revealing any confidential information, I can tell you um, one teacher was on maternity leave for family reasons. She has decided to um, stay home with her baby for the year. Another teacher has made a career change um, for, uh, into private industry. And a third teacher who lives in Rhode Island um, accepted a position in, in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. So those are the reasons for um, the three teacher um, mm -hmm. resignations that you see on the uh, agenda for this evening. Then it shouldn't be that hard to put in the uh you know, maybe on the survey as to what, why are these people leaving? All of those three are, are very valid reasons. Anybody who wants to leave has, has a valid reason, of course. Of course, uh, but you know, Mr. Like, Martins, after you leave a position, it's, it's you know, HR's doing, um, you know, putting forth their best effort in terms of asking people to respond, whereas the purpose of the district capacity pro, um, project and the work that we're specifically doing at um, Durfee is to determine the reasons why our teachers are leaving, if any of that is in our control, specifically around working conditions or levels of support, what can we do as a school and district to address those to really um, you know, ensure that we're retaining our, uh, our teachers? So more work on the front end rather than the um, after someone has left. We want to understand uh, the root causes of teachers leaving and then put um, measures in place to, um, to address that. You. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Any further discussion on that topic? Do I have a request for executive session? It would be, uh, Mr. Chairman, the purpose of the executive session would be several fold. The first is National Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Section 1, Subsection 1, to discuss the open meeting law complaints filed by C.J. Ferry and Patrick Higgins against the Forever School Committee and Mayor C. Samuel Sutter as chairman. Also, Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Subsection 7, to review and approve Executive Committee, meeting, meeting, <laughs> Executive Committee Minutes for calendar years 2014 and 2015. Also, Mass General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 21A, Subsection 3, 
to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and litigation with security officers, paraprofessionals, custodians, FREA, FRA, and government employees, as the chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the negotiating and legal positions and strategy of the bargaining unit, also to discuss and report on grievances. Um, also, National Laws Chapter 38, Section 21A, Subsection 2, to discuss to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, including Mr. Nathaniel Gizak, School Administrative Manager, Mr. Brian Michael Azak, School Information Coordinator, Ms. Nancy Casper Magoni, I'm sorry about that, Redesign Coach and Superintendent Meg Mayo Brown. We would reconvene. There may or may not be statements at that time. Second. Mr. Andrews? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Martins? Yes. Mr. Maynard? Yes. Mrs. Panchley? Yes. Yes, Senator? Yes. Hello again. Roll call. Mr. Andrade? Here. Mr. Costa? Here. Mr. Hart? Here. Mr. Martins? Here. Mr. Maynard? Here. Mrs. Panchley? Here. Mayor Sutter? Here. So now we have a vote Mr. to come back into formal session? No. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I have a motion. Okay. Mr. Vice Chairman. Motion to ratify the contract between the security offices and the Forever School Department. Second. Second. Yes. Mr. Andrews? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mr. Maynard? Yes. Mrs. Pantry? Yes. Mayor Sutter? Yes. Motion to approve the contract between Nathaniel Jazak, um, School Ad Administrative Manager, and the Forever School Committee. Second. As negotiated. Mr. Andrews? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mr. Maynard? Yes. Mrs. Panchley? Yes. Mayor yes. Sutter? Yes. Motion to deny the grievance 9 15 between the Forever School Committee and the FREA. Second. Mr. Andre? No. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Martins? No. Mr. Maynard? Yes. Mrs. Panchley? Yes. Mayor Sutter? Yes. Motion to uphold the grievance 5 15 between the Forever School Committee and the Forever Educators Association. Second. Mr. Andrew? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mr. Maynard? Yes. Mrs. Panchley? No. Mayor Sutter? Yes. Motion to approve the contract with uh, Nancy Mag uh, Magoni as negotiated. Second. Mr. Andre? Yes. Mr. Costa? No. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mr. Maynard? Yes. Mrs. Panchley? No. Mayor Sutter? Yes. Motion to adjourn. Second. Mr. Uh, Chairman, on the second, before we vote, I just wanted to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? All right. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn? Did we do it? Can we adjourn? Yes. Yes. Oh, I have to vote. Do I have to vote? I think so. <laughs> Mr. Andre? Yes. Mr. Costa? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Mr. Martin? Yes. Mr. Maynard? Yes. Mrs. Panchley? Yes. Mayor Sutter? Yes.